Notre Dame fans, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It is Thursday, December 23rd. We're a day away from our Christmas Eve mailbag. We're two That's days true. from Christmas. We're and not going to get to talk to you all personally on Christmas, so we're going to just go ahead and tell you now, Merry Christmas to everybody. Absolutely. A happy New Year. For those of you who may uh, be of the uh, our Jewish brethren that may be shown, happy Hanukkah coming up here soon at some point in time. Uh, but um, yeah. Happy Festivus. Today's yes, Festivus. Festivus for the rest of us, baby. <laughs> I just had so, to educate my son on what Festivus was. Yeah, so we had a little bonding. Right. I had to educate you yesterday on who Michael Scarn was. That is that is very true. Yeah, so, you did. You know, you did. never too old to learn. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to have a – Vince, you were getting ready to say something. Looked like you were getting ready to say something. When I was, uh, was going to say Christmas. about Festivus. That's all. Oh, we're yeah. good. Yeah. Today's show is going to be a little bit different. We were gonna. We're, we may, depending on how long some of these other topics take. You know, we'll get into to some bowl stuff. But we wanted to kind of. There's some things going on that we want to address. You know, in Notre Dame Nation. So you know, let's throw a little curveball here because we're gonna have all next week to continue our breakdown of the game. So we're gonna discuss the latest with the Notre Dame coaching staff search, and there are some things that we're gonna discuss today that if you were a premium member of Irish Breakdown, you'd have known a week ago. And so mm-hmm. we're going to, and, and days ago with new updates. So we're going to dive into right. some of that stuff. Who may be coming, who may be going, who may not be going that people think is going. And then we'll talk about the safety position, which endured another transfer last night. Car- Carrie G has transferred out of Notre Dame. And depending on how that goes, we may dive into, you know, how long that takes. We may dive into some, uh, some you know, just some bowl stuff, just kind of who for Notre Dame needs to step up. If we don't get that today, we will definitely get that next week for sure. So Vince, <sighs> they're uh, still putting together a a coaching staff at Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah. But things are looking things of, that of some the spots open are looking positions. a little interesting. I yep. like where things are headed. Um, I will be much happier when we get some solid, you know, sourcing that they may be looking for another position coach. But what they've done well, so far, I've been very, I'm I'm happy about. Right. And and we'll we'll just bless you. We'll discuss kind of where they are right now. So obviously, if my math is correct, Notre Dame has six full time assistants hired, correct? Uh so they yes. have Tommy Reese Absolutely. on offense, Lance yep. Taylor on offense. I'm sorry, they have seven. Sorry, there's seven coaches that right now that we don't know if they're that we as far as we know are coming back. Uh Tommy Reese, Lance Taylor, John McNulty. Yep. Mark, Mike Elston. Chris O'Leary and Mike Mickens, as far as we know. Yes. We'll get into the potential seventh here in a minute. Positions that we definitely know are open. Our offensive line coach, defensive coordinator, and uh, linebackers coach, or there could be a chance that we see some people move around. I think with a guy like Mike Elson on staff, you have the freedom to say, hey, look, if the best available guy is a D-line coach, you could move Mike Elson to linebackers, but that guy would have to be one heck of a D-line coach to, to move yeah. Mike Elson oh, away. Yeah. But we've talked about if Mike Elson <laughs> becomes a D coordinator, then you may do it. But you know, I, I, my understanding is Mike Elson has not been eliminated as a D coordinator, but that's not the direction that they're going. That's not the direction that Mike Elson thought it was going to go when he decided to come back. So th- that's the that's another position. Then, of course, there's a tenth position, which in the past few years has been used by the special teams coordinator. Correct. Our understanding is that that Marcus Freeman is looking at hiring a special teams guy. Now, whether or not that guy will also be able to coach another position, something Brian Pulley did not, remains to be seen. I think it depends on the guy. But they are looking to hire someone whose emphasis will be on special teams. So those are the openings right now. <clears throat> and two of those spots, we feel like we have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And um, but you know, but that's kind of the makeup of the staff, Vince, and that's where Notre Dame is. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very excited about where, like I said, it, and again, if you're a, a member of the message board, then this isn't really new information for you, but it is still really good information. Like I like the 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 direction that that Marcus Freeman is going. I think that <clears throat> at times maybe he doesn't move as fast as we all would like him well, to move, can. but he can't. And that's right. what I was going to say. He can't, and and I think he's doing a very good job of of doing his due diligence. 
to get while the also right preparing for a bowl game. So okay, that's exactly right. What yes. we know here's where we are, and we'll dive into some names because we're not going to do that to you. We're not going to tease you about oh we're excited, but we're not going to tell you who to are. You got to go to the message board to get that. We've been saying that for a while. If you want to get this information as it as we get it, that's why you need to be a part of the premium message board because <clears throat> we've put updates on this. So I'm going to talk about the O-line coach, talk about the special teams coordinator, talk about the coordinator, and then we'll talk about the receivers coach and where things are with that. So to begin, Vince, offensive line. Yes. This has been an interesting situation, and so we're just going to kind of fill you in with all the intel that we've been able to gather here over the last few weeks. Number one, uh, it is absolutely 100% certain that that there will be a new offensive line coach in Notre Dame next year. That has yes. been known <clears> – <throat> For weeks, uh, that is something that 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 was never up for debate. That was something that was decided almost immediately after the coaching change happened. And so, Coach Quinn has stayed on as we expected to coach the team through the through the bowl game. I'm here. I've heard that he's done a great job with that. You know, and and as we expected, he would because he's a professional and he's a good man and he cares about the kids. And so, you know, obviously he, you know, I was told he wasn't necessarily happy that he's not being brought back because uh, he wanted to be at Notre Dame and. And uh, probably feels like, um, you know, people like me and, and Vince are, are wrong and that he's done a good job with the line. But and that's uh, fine. Never doubted <clears throat> that he was going to do the right thing by the kids. And right. so that's that's what we've seen. So Notre Dame has been sort of on a coaching search for a while. I believe we talked about this next part. What we were told is as soon as the season was over with that Notre Dame uh, – was getting not they didn't even have to pursue O line coaches really that much. They were getting calls from coaches around the country about, hey, I'm interested in this job. If it comes open, because at the time it wasn't known that Jeff Quinn definitely was not going to return, and so it was said, hey, look, if if a, if this job comes open, I'd, I'm definitely interested. Right, I, I'd I'd like to be a part of it. Sorry about that. I felt like I was going to sneeze. <clears throat> I have no idea so, what that's like. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you actually have allergies. Yeah. A major bummer. <laughs> well, and I'm used. And by the way, just for I'm used to going to the left to sneeze. Oh, there's a wall there now. Yeah. that's not going to work. I got to retrain. So if you myself. see Vince hit himself and knock back and then like <laughs> get passed did. out for a minute, you're gonna know what happened. <laughs> so, with offensive line wise, a lot of candidates reached out. And pretty early on, that list of candidates got narrowed down to three or four guys, then a yeah. couple guys. The two candidates that Notre Dame really liked the most are Justin Fry, who is currently the the offensive line coach and offensive coordinator at UCLA. And that's the key. And <laughs> Harry Heastan, the mm -hmm. former Notre Dame coach. That one is very interesting. We'll get into that one in a second. So Justin Fry was a guy that I know Notre Dame has had conversations with. I have I have talked to multiple sources that inform me that uh, while it wasn't necessarily like a formal interview, like he didn't come in and interview like he did in 2017 he was one of the coaches that interviewed right in 2017 to replace harry he stand he was not the guy that the notre dame players picked that they, the guy that they wanted that that guy is now <clears throat> the offensive line coach for the tampa bay buccaneers so but they you know some some you know he did a nice job then but he's gotten a lot more experience now he's four years older now and he's done a really nice job at ucla he's an indiana native He's a Midwestern guy, coached at BC under Steve Adazio. He was a GA at Florida when Urban Meyer was there, also under Steve Adazio, who's the o -line, one of the O-line coaches there. Really good young offensive line coach. What we were told about the conversation is it was kind of two guys that they really liked, not that he was necessarily the top guy, but they were interested. And when you're interested in a guy, when you have it down to two or three guys, one of the things you have conversations with all of them about is, okay, what would it take to get you here? Right. And so you have that conversation with everybody that you kind of have as a finalist. And it became pretty obvious early on that that Notre Dame wasn't going to be willing to give Justin Fry the things he needed to come, not just financial, but also responsibility. Notre Dame Titles has an offensive and, coordinator, yeah. right? I mean, and run game coordinator is a step down from offensive coordinator. And if it you're is. going to take a demotion from a title standpoint, that's going to get made up for in salary. And it just it was it was very clear that it wasn't it just wasn't going to be a fit in 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 that regards. The other guy that was the top candidate and the guy that I've been told all along is the guy that was sort of the desired candidate, Terry Heastan. Now this has been an interesting development. So I talked to a source, good source, last night 
mm. someone who was one of the people that that was instrumental in us find uh, us at Irish Breakdown breaking that Marcus Freeman was actually the candidate. Uh, so while everybody else is talking about Luke Fickle, and I mean everybody else, I'm talking about the national media, national not, people, not our not right. our brethren at, at on the Notre Dame beat. We're talking about the national media. I don't know what was being said on the Notre Dame beat, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean I, I don't know what was being said. I only know what people were telling me about the national media, and right? Luke Fickle, and we were very much nope. That's not what Steve we're hearing. Steve that's right, my oh, favorite, God. by the way. Uh, <laughs> Pat Narduzzi. Yeah, uh, but while the, the Luke Fickle train, we kept saying yes, no name likes Luke Fickle, but we keep hearing that that Marcus Freeman is 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 still the the guy that that, that we think it's going to go towards, and we were the first people to report that that was going to be the next hire, and this was one of the sources that was a part of getting us that information. So a good source, really good source. Yeah. So talked to talked to him last night, and he confirmed what I had been told by uh, one other source that I wasn't certain on, but then I got it confirmed by this source that. Notre Dame actually reached out to Harry Heastand during the season about hmm. helping out. And he said he wasn't interested. I found that interesting, but not surprising. I found it interesting they reached out. If anyone that knows the dynamic between Brian Kelly and Harry Heastand, you're not surprised that he said no thanks. Ex and that, uh, that would have been my point. And the fact correct. that my guess is it wasn't Brian Kelly that reached out per se. I'm sure he, they had his blessing. Sure. But – it probably wasn't him dialing the phone. Right. That was never going to happen. That was never going to happen. Part. Okay. Right. That was never going to happen. <laughs> right. He was never going to come. So anyway, what I was then told, and this I was told this like immediately after the season by multiple good sources. As soon as the whole Kelly thing leaving and Marcus Freeman being hired, Coach Eastan said, hey, just so you know, I would be interested in coming back now because the person that, the, the two people that he did not want to really work with are no longer there. And so, of course, when the offensive coordinator played for two years under Coach Eastan, he was responsible for building a line that allowed that offensive coordinator to only get sacked eight times his senior year, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also coached with him in 2017. They were on the same coaching staff in 2017. Obviously, there's going to be some interest there. Now, the latest that we are told is that there are still a couple things that have to get ironed out from a contract standpoint. But from what we are told, it is something would have to change dramatically for Harry Heastan not to be the next offensive line coach in Notre Dame uh, again. And so uh, that is obviously something that is um, very, very exciting. It warms my heart. And I can so, tell you that right now. That's yeah. um, it. So, so far with the opening, like, I, I don't think I could have, you know, drawn it up any better than the way things are going right now. As far as Marcus Freeman being hired, the guys that he kept up to this point, the, the ones that they, they're filling and who they're filling with. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, because <laughs> there's because there's more to this story as well, which I think are you going to touch on? Are you going to go to the next evolution of this? OK, you mean like um, who, what else might be happening on the staff? Yeah. No, because okay. that's not, that's I'm not, I don't feel as comfortable with that sourcing. That's fine. I'm, that's I'm not going to put anything out in a, <clears throat> oh, like I'll say things on a message board because I can gotcha. say, I can preface, Hey, listen, here's, here's where it's at. I'm not real confident in this. I don't really feel pu putting that stuff kind of out there because this is going to have a right. bigger audience. And yep. so absolutely, um, no, I, I will only yeah, yeah. ever put information out that I can, that I feel confident. So what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to put some posts out about how, oh, here are the eight names I've heard for defensive coordinator or offensive line coach, because the reality is that's that there's no way they've reached out to that many people for this job officially. Now, there may be I, – I, you called me and I listened. So we're only going to ever put out – which is why you haven't heard us put out anything really about the about the you know defensive coordinator position because we've heard so many different names and none of – there's been no consistent – intel on who that is so that's why we right. haven't put names out because i just don't feel that's fair uh to you all that we're just throwing random names out it's also not fair to those coaches in the places exactly. they are because if exactly. it may be a situation where notre dame reaches out to a guy and he says no i'm not interested well then it gets back to somebody 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 to say hey so and so is a candidate for this job well there may be recruits or other players saying hey look man why is coach thinking about going to this when he's like i'm not i they called me. Right. I said no, you know, and, and I just don't think that's fair. Yeah. So um No, I completely agree yeah. with that. So I will I will just say it, it, if Harry Heastan, you know, you know, inks it on, on the contract, right? That's a huge pickup 
It's a huge if, win. Still an if. It's that's still right. It's not if official it happens, yet, from what I know. If it happens, not only is that a win for Marcus Freeman, but that's a win for Tommy Reese because yeah. it's just one less thing he's got to worry about. I mean, he can be because right now, look, he game plans, you know, for games, knowing what his strengths and his weaknesses are, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's parts of the playbook that you just can't go to, right? I mean, that you, and that's how it is on any team, right? I mean, that just is what it is. Mm -hmm. If things get short up up front, that opens up more of the playbook. That's 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 yeah. where I'll put it. And so it's right. a win not only for Marcus Freeman, but it's a huge win for Tommy Reese. It's going to allow him right. to be as creative as he can possibly be. You know what I mean? Like his imagination and the personnel that he has are the only things that would put a box around it. You know what mm -hmm. this offense could be. That that's what I'll say. And right. I'm very excited about that possibility. So that's kind of, and Vince, as I'm kind of finish this up, if you can kind of go through and see if there's any questions about this offensive about this? line thing. I did see a couple things. We will try to get to those. Yeah, I'll throw uh, this one as, right as, here. Uh, so, yeah, this is a good one. RJG Irving. What's interesting is some of the veterans were recruited by Harry Eastan. So obviously that's Zeke true. Carell, Andrew Christoffick, Quinn Carroll, they were recruited by Harry Eastan. Jerry Patterson was not. My, my my bet would be is is that they're going to look at that and say, hey, this is the guy that turned Notre Dame into O-line U. Notre Dame was not O-line U before Harry Easton arrived. Right. They're going to look at the Pro Bowl and see, you know, the two best guards in the National Football League are both Notre Dame guys that were coached under Harry Easton. They know Chris Watt. He coached there last year. Chris Watt's coaching style is very similar to Harry Heastan's because Harry Heastan was involved in that. You, so, a lot of times you coach like how you yeah. were coached. Now, for some of these players, the 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 – being coached by Harry Heastan is going to be a, a culture shock to them. And and they're either going to like it and jump on board or they're not going to like it and they're going to be unhappy and maybe leave. That's fine. They have 18, they have a potential to have 18 kids on scholarship next year. If you look at Josh Lug and John Jerkson, if those two guys don't come back, and I don't anticipate they will at this time, that still leaves you 16 offensive linemen. And they can stand to lose a couple who don't want to be coached hard. That's just that's the reality. And I honestly don't care who they are. If there's a guy that we think is a future star that doesn't want to be coached hard by Harry Heastan, then okay, that's cool. Go get coached by somebody else if that's not your style. But I think this group is obviously, and one thing I was told is part of the reason that coach Heastan was interested in coming back is obviously, because I was told he was kind of done coaching. He Now, when right. I say done coaching for an O-line coach, that doesn't mean he's in retirement mode. That means he's now going to be doing on the clinic circuit. He's going to be doing camps. He's. I was told that he was taking a lot of interest in working with his past players. He was still coaching them, uh, working with them, as we've reported here. He did in 2020 with the Notre Dame offensive line. He's working with younger offensive line coaches. So he's still working. It just wasn't as a coach at a school or for a team. When this job came open, this apparently was the one job Harry Heastan was interested in coming back for. Number one, he doesn't have to move. He right. still lives in South Bend. Exactly. <laughs> and the other the other thing I was told too is he loves loves this place. Has a I, I've been told that he has a, a, a holds Tommy Reese in pretty high regard as a as a really sharp young coach. I would think so, based on. Yeah. And I was also told that he looked at the talent on this team and said this team has a ton of talent, and didn't feel and it was being do. used properly. And they do. He is especially high on the tackles. I was told he looks at Joe Walt and Blake Fisher as stars. Uh, now, hopefully they take well to his coaching. Mm -hmm. That's my only concern. That's a and different I, style. I think Joe Walt will. <clears throat> I don't know about Blake Fisher. I hopefully he does because if Blake Fisher can, if Blake Fisher can take coach, he stands hard coaching style. Blake Fisher will be a top 10 draft pick at whatever position he wants to be a top 10 draft pick at. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, we'll see if I don't, you know, I've heard he's not willing to move to guard. Hopefully somebody can change his mind if the need arises, because it may not need me need, need may not arise. That would require Tosh Baker to have a big off season. And right sure. now we don't know if he's going to do that. So, but I'm told he loves the talent of this. And this is another question. I have a, a source of mine who's re trying to reach out and find that out today. My my guess would be, my bet would be, the, the that's question is, how much does this affect Patterson's decision? Oh yeah, that's right. This, the podcast. That's right. Of course, events. That's why. <laughs> that's the producer. Yes, football <laughs> analyst slash producer. <laughs> right. uh, my understanding is, David, is that that uh, that's going to Jarrett Patterson. From what I'm told, was not necessarily thrilled with how he felt his game was being developed. And Jared Patterson knows a lot of the older players. Mm -hmm. He knows who they worked out with last summer. 
Because remember, he was yeah. the young guy on an right. older line. You know, that were all coached by Harry Heastan. Right, exactly. Now, here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> Harry Heastan didn't recruit Jarrett Patterson. Harry Heastan was trying to get Nicholas Pettit Frere to be his fifth right. offensive lineman in that class and was okay. going to get him. I've had people in Ohio State tell me, yeah, if Harry doesn't leave Notre Dame, we don't get that kid. Well, he's now getting ready to, you know, it's projected to be a first round pick this year from Ohio mm-hmm. State. So uh, I don't, I don't, I, from what I know of Jarrett Patterson and his dad, I highly doubt that there'd be any, any feelings, negative feelings that they didn't recruit Jarrett. I, I don't think so. And especially since he's had relationships with some of the older players who hold coach, he stand in such high regard. So I would imagine it wouldn't, that wouldn't be an issue. And I think Jared's thing is Jared wants to be pushed. He wants to be coached. He wants to get the I best those players man. out of them. And, and I, I, he has to know that Harry, he stands going to be that guy. And with all due respect to Nick Martin and Sam Mustafer, who are good football players and they were good football players in Notre Dame. They're both have started games in the national football league. None of them have Jarrett Patterson's God-given ability at center. Mm-hmm. And a year under Harry Heastan would, I think, do wonders for him. And here's the other thing, too. Harry Heastan Hole is held in very high regard amongst NFL people. I think the, probably the only person in the NFL that doesn't think highly of Harry Heastan is probably Matt Nagy, who's <laughs> terrible, and his right. opinion shouldn't matter anyway. <clears throat> but when Harry Heastan gets, picks up the phone and says, yeah, you want a center? This is your dude. People will listen to because he won't just do that for every single player. Right. He'll only he, he what I've been told is Harry is very honest with NFL teams about his players. Very honest. And so when he says this guy's a stud, then 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 they believe him. Now he and may look, and we we talked we've right, talked yeah. about this on a from a high school coach standpoint to college recruiters. It's the same mm-hmm. thing. If you blow smoke up college recruiters' butts as a high school coach, they're not going to come to you and mm-hmm. ask you your opinion about guys anymore. OK, they may still recruit your guys because they're really good, mm-hmm. but they're not going to ask you for your opinion. I, I had right. a head coach that I worked for one time who had guys in the past, but like in the current cycle, he didn't have anybody. But coaches were coming to him, asking him about guys, you know, in the area like, hey, who should we be looking at? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's because he was honest with them about his own guys, pluses and minuses. Mm-hmm. Same thing here. That's the exact same thing you're talking about. Harry, he stands an honest dude. But right. if he is going to go to the mat for a guy and he's going to say, right. this is the guy that you want, they're going to listen because right. he doesn't just say, oh, all my guys are so good. Right. You know, that's important. He'll, he'll be honest about here's the strengths and here's his weaknesses. Sure. Here's the thing, schemes I think think he'll fit in and that kind of thing. I do want to respond to this. Kevin says, yes, Harry is back. We're not, not saying yet. that. Not yet. Because it's not official. And I don't expect any kind of announcement until after the bowl game. I, th- that's the What we're saying is that's the direction it's right. trending. And barring something changing, that's what we think is going to happen, right? So I'm trying, I'm, I'm leaving that out, not to protect myself, but to say until it's signed on the dotted line, anything, anything can, can happen, happen man. <laughs> and just... we've seen that happen before. But the, what we're saying is that's what we think is going to happen. Um, DMND13 says, do you think the Harry Heastan hire would affect the positions players play, like Blake moving inside to guard, for example? My understanding is that Coach Heastan likes Blake Fisher as a tackle right now, as do we. The whole guard thing is kind of taken off. Uh, my whole point is I want Blake to be willing to move to guard if that's what's best for the team. Right. Right now, I don't know if that's what's best for the team because Tosh Baker has to get a lot better before I'm willing to have sure. that conversation. We think Tosh has tremendous upside. My whole point is, is if Tosh emerges and Tosh is one of your clearly one of your five best, then would would Blake be willing to move to guard where he could be a, you know, let's be honest, a Quentin Nelson-esque type of player? That's the potential that he has. But that has to – the only way you move Blake to guard, and this is what I've always felt, and, and I want to make sure people understand this because it's kind of moved into where now he just should move to guard. I'm not saying he should move to guard. I'm saying he should be open to moving to guard if that's what's best for the, lo- the rest of the line. Right now, there's no reason to move him to guard because Tosh Baker has not proven himself to the right. point where you would move him to guard. That's something that would happen in the spring or next fall. Right now, what I'm told is that Coach Heastan looks at, at, at Alt and Fisher as future stars mm-hmm. at tackle. That's 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 what we see. Now, would Blake Fisher be open to moving to guard? Right now, probably not. In the future, if certain things are happening and he trusts like Harry, he stands like a walk in a room to Blake Fisher on the first day they meet and say, move to guard. He's like, I'm not moving to guard. Right. I mean, you know, like 
but that's if not they, how you build a rapport with no, somebody that you've never met. No, uh, and, you know, and you know my understanding I mean? is yeah. that's not how Coach Eastan views Blake <clears throat> Fisher. My understanding right. is that Coach Fish, Coach Eastan views Blake Fisher as a tackle, and and so do a lot of people. Ryan Harris has talked. We had him on the show this summer. Said that the kid's a future star at tackle. The emergence of Joe Ald has simply given you more flexibility if Tosh Baker also emerges. Well, as of right now, Tosh has not emerged. Right. So exactly. right now, if I'm building an offensive line, and I said this on the message board lately, is is if if Tosh emerges, then I think the five best would probably involve some I some notion of Blake inside. But if Tosh doesn't emerge, and right now he hasn't, my starting five next year projection is going to include Tosh ba- or I mean uh, Blake Fisher and Joe Wald at tackle. The only question is is who plays left and who plays right. That's the yeah. only question mark at this point in time. Right. And I think, to me, I would put Blake at right because I think Blake Blake has the potential to be a dominant elite run and pass blocker. And I just – my personal preference is, is to have a guy like that at right tackle in college mm-hmm. and and play him there. And then, you know, maybe – you know, and then to me, Joe Alt is more of a pass blocker, you know, that kind of thing. But honestly, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's, it, it doesn't it's split matter. splitting hairs, to be honest with you. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, for for people that don't know, Spark uh, wants to know how how is his recruiting prowess. The the interesting thing is, there was this narrative that was created after Coach Eastan left. Of course, it was that you know, he didn't like to recruit and he wasn't a good recruiter. And and let me, the, the, I don't know why this was created because I didn't create it and I don't really know where it started, but it is utter nonsense. Harry Heastan did not like to recruit in the traditional sense that he liked to be out on the road. And you know, no, Harry Heastan got in a film room and said, I want that kid, that kid, that, and he'd pick a list of guys. And then he'd get those guys on campus, meet the kids, make sure that they lived up to his, what he was looking for. And then he would say, these are the four that I want. And he would go get them. And more often than not, he got them. Yeah. He had some misses along the way. Of course. And, and and I remember one time somebody said, well, what about the year he only signed two offensive linemen? That hurt the depth chart. Okay, first of all, that came after a two-year period where in 2013 he signed three offensive linemen that were ranked in the top 100 by at least one service, and that didn't include Mike McGlinchey. And then the year after that, he signed an offensive line class that included Quentin Nelson, Alex Barr, Sam Musfer, and Jimmy Byrne. The next year, 2015, they signed a three-man offensive line class. It was Trevor Ruland, who was a top 300 recruit, Tristan Hodge was a top 100 recruit, and Jerry Tillery. Harry, he stands the one that recruited Harry Tillery. Well, Jerry decided late in the process, like right before he enrolled early, that he wanted to play defense. Well, it was too late for Notre Dame to go find another offensive lineman. They had just signed nine guys the two years before. So that's why they only signed two. And so a lot of people forget that. And then the next year they went out and had a class that had Liam Eikenberg, Parker Boudreau, and Tommy Kramer. And then, the, and and by the way, for those who don't know, and this isn't my opinion, this is what I was told by the prospects, is that that Urban Meyer personally took over the recruitment for Liam Eikenberg and Harry Heastand, or both Ohio kids. I mean, for Urban Meyer took over the recruitment for Liam Eikenberg and Tommy Kramer, and still they couldn't yeah. get them to Ohio Went State. Over. Went over. And if remember, they also beat Ohio State for Jimmy Byrne. Ohio State really wanted Jimmy Byrne, who's from St. Ignatius in the 2014 class. And then 2017, he signs Robert Hainsey, Aaron Banks, Dylan Gibbons, and uh, Josh Lug. 2018 class wasn't as good. Obviously, they signed uh, Cole Mabry, who Harry Heastan liked a lot. Cole was actually progressing well until injuries kind of derailed his career. Luke Jones was a guy that they got kind of late to because they were needed some numbers. They got uh, Tr- John Dirksen. A guy who hasn't panned out, which my counter to that has always been, I would have liked to see what John Dirksen could have been with four years of Harry Eastan. And then, of course, they got um, – uh, so Luke Jones, Cole Mabry, John Dirksen. Who's the fourth guy that I'm missing from that class, Vince? I'm trying to remember who else was part of the 2018 class. Uh, but that class wasn't as strong. But what people kind of forget is – Is that the Patterson class? Yeah, but he didn't recruit Jarrett Patterson. Okay. I thought Jarrett Patterson was the fifth offensive lineman, but I, I could be incorrect on that. Let me just pull this up here real quick. J- uh, Luke Jones, John Dirksen, Cole Mabry. So, no, it was three. It was a four-man class. Okay. And then, now, he would have had Nick pettit Frere, who was a top 100 recruit and and is that. now projected as a first-round pick. But when, when Harry left, obviously he ended up signing. He still almost picked Notre Dame. 
but he ended up going out. And then uh, Brian Polian, to, and to a degree, Jeff Quinn went out and got Jarrett Patterson when it was obvious they were going to lose the other kid, which was a great finishing you know, way to finish that. Now, what people forget, however, is that Harry Heastan also had a commitment from Andrew Kristoffic in that class. And Harry Heastan was the primary driver of the recruitment. Notre, when Harry Heastan left Notre Dame, Notre Dame led for – they already had commitments from John Olmsted and Andrew Kristoffic, okay? And and he he also was um, – he also was the driver behind – because Andrew Kristoffic committed in, in uh, December, I believe. He also – Notre Dame was the leader for Quinn Carroll and Zeke Carell. So the first class that, that all the people that have been like the, the Jeff Quinn stands the last four years, like, well, look at that great recruiting class he put together. That was primarily put together by Harry Heastan. Mm-hmm. And so the people who want to bash Heastan for some odd, it's very odd reason. I, I don't, I can't fathom that because it's not, it's not on our board that, that, that exists in some other thing and that people tell me about. Um, he had one questionable class and that class would have included a top hundred pick who people are projecting as a first round pick in it. Uh, and that was 2018, which was not a great year offensive line wise, especially in pro Notre Dame areas. But the question is recruiting, which I find very odd. And they just want to ignore the fact that Notre – I mean, Zeke Carell was on record as saying, I was all set to go to Notre Dame until Coach Heastan left. Then I had to kind of get reintroduced with Coach Quinn, and Coach Quinn did a nice job getting those guys back in the fold. He did. He did a nice job getting those guys back in the fold. But it's a lot easier to land a kid when you take over a recruitment that you already lead for as a school. And so uh, recruiting prowess, it's, a, it's going to be different. But at the end of the day, he gets it done. He gets mm-hmm. the guys he wants. Yeah. And absolutely. when, and you can't, you better, you better darn well believe that, that guys like Quentin Nelson and Zach Martin and, and Robert Hainsey and Mike McGlinchey and all those guys are going to be the first ones on the phone telling kids, oh, yeah, you want to come play for this guy. And that's going to be huge. That's yeah. going to be huge. I, I've got one more comment here. Um, and you can take it whichever way you want. And then we've got a couple super chats I want to get to. No idea how reliable it is, but I've been hearing Harry Heastan and Chris Watt are sort of a package deal. Is there any validity to that? That's, I believe, what you were referring to earlier, Vince, about the other part of it. I, I'm not going to speak to that because I don't have as much solid confirmation. We have talked about that on the message board for about three weeks now. Uh, so I, I don't want to say too much. It would not surprise me, but that's based on just what I know of the situation. I don't have any good sourcing that's really said definitively, this is going to happen. So I don't want to pretend like, oh yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. Cause I don't know. I don't know right now if that is going to happen because my sourcing on that has not been as definitive as some of the other stuff. And what I pro- I've always promised you guys, I'm not going to blow smoke up your behinds. I'm not going to tell you something like, well, a source said that I don't really know if it's true or not. And then down the road, be like, well, the source is wrong. Or, oh, it just turned out differently. Look, I'm going to tell you what I feel comfortable saying. I'm pretty confident this is the case. Mm -hmm. Um, That wouldn't surprise me just based on knowing their relationship. I know that it's been discussed as a possibility. That I will say confidently. Will it happen or not? I I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I, I don't. We do have super chats I want to get to. Uh, first from uh, Kassa Hodge. Thank you very much. Uh, would you be opposed to moving Tosh Baker to guard? I, I would. Number one, Tosh is way too tall for guard. He's six. He's eight. like 6'8", isn't he? Yeah, he's 6'8". Yeah. And not only is he 6'8", but he plays tall. Mm-hmm. And that's not what you want to guard. There have been 6'8 guards before in the NFL, but it's, it's not ideal. And those guys usually have really good ability to, to play with good pad level. I don't know if that's necessarily where I would want to move Tosh. And he's also not a power player. And and the way that Tommy Reese runs his offense, you've got to have guards that can move people. And that's also very similar to what Coach Eastan wants. And that's another thing we wouldn't discuss if Harry Heastan does to take the job. Harry Heastan no, and Tommy Reese are going to be speaking the same language when he arrives. There's no teaching the new coach things. you know. And, and if there are some wrinkles that you've added, which there have been, those are things Harry Heastan picks up like that. And there are going to be mm-hmm. variations of things he's already done. But I just don't think guard is the is the is the place to be for that. And 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 the other thing too is is like when you talk about moving a guy like Blake Fisher, it's gotta be a no-brainer that this is our right. best five. If it's Absolutely. like Tosh is slightly better than than Andrew Kristoff or Rocco Spindler, then you don't make that move. 
you only make this move if you're like, you know, these are these are our three best linemen, and we got to find a way to get them on the field. I think I'd be more willing to move Joe Alt to guard than I would Tosh Baker, just as far as a fit. But the reality is, is none of those other guys. The reason, the re, just so we're clear, the only reason we've ever talked about wanting to move Blake Fisher to guard is because we think he would be elite there. Oh, yeah. It's not that he can't play tackle. It's not, not that all. he couldn't be a great tackle. It's like if you have three great tackles on your roster, right? If you got three guys that you think can be elite tackles or great tackles, but only one of them could also be an elite guard, it's a no-brainer. You move the guy that could also be right. an elite and guard. You you want so again, it's the it's the um and I don't want to say he invented it because he didn't, but this is how he operated. The best five get on the field. If that's what you're doing and you have three guys that can all play tackle and they're the one, they're three of the best five, somebody's got to move to guard. And if somebody's moving to guard, it's Blake Fisher and he's the next Quentin Nelson. Like that's that's what we're talking about here. Like I'm it's not, not that oh Blake's not athletic enough no, or he's not, not good enough or anything like that. No, I think Blake could be a great tackle. Uh and Blake's even Blake was the number one offensive recruit in my on my board ahead of Tyler Buckner coming out of high school. And he was even better than I thought he was going to be as a freshman. So it, it has nothing to do with that. Blake can play tackle. There's no doubt about that. If you, if they ever move him to guard, it's because they think he could be, like you said, a future top 10 to 15 draft pick of guard. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, you know, that's how Coach Eastan always recruited. For the most part, he recruited guys that played tackle in high school. Even Sam Mustafer, who's built like an interior guy, yes, he is. was a left tackle in high school. I mean, mm-hmm. He was a tackle on film. That doesn't mean he wouldn't like it. He would love a guy like Rocco Spindler. That's a that's a different and there have been some. I mean, Tristan Hodge played center in high school and sure. he recruited Tristan Hodge. So uh he'll certainly look at that. But no, I don't think Tosh is a is a guy that I would look at for that position. The other super chats we have don't really pertain to the it's okay. offensive line. We'll, you want we'll to throw those? Because then because we're okay. we're kind of we've kind of talked about the line part. Yeah. We'll yeah, yeah. We'll move on to some of the other stuff that we've heard. Cool. Uh Sean Hopkins, thank you very much for the super chat. You may have answered this in another video that I missed, but who do you think should be Freeman's defensive coordinator replacement or who do you think it will be? So two questions in there, really. There isn't an answer to the second one because yeah. he hasn't decided. Right. And anyone that says that he has is, is, is I don't, I don't think their information is necessarily accurate as of last night. Uh, I know there's candidates he likes. We've heard about several of those candidates. Uh, I've said I'm not going to throw names out. You know, maybe we can put them on the board later. Sean, I know that you've recently signed up for the message board, so I asked this question on the message board because, for reasons I already discussed, there's a like this there's video right is going to get a it. lot more play than a post I make on a private message board. Right. And 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 I don't think it's fair to just throw names out about coaches that. Um, that I just, I'm not, and this isn't a criticism of what anybody else has done. I'm just telling you what my philosophy is. That's just is. how we operate here. That's I mean, it. Just, That's yeah, it. Exactly. And, I, and I respect however everybody else does their sites. I, I Again, I'm not responding to things that have been said other places. I'm just telling you how, how we do it. Because we haven't had a chance to do a lot of this since we launched this channel because there haven't been a lot of coaching turnover. Right. But I'm not comfortable throwing names out unless I'm really confident that this is trend that this is moving in that direction. And simply having a conversation with another coach or saying, hey, if you're interested, I'd like to talk. Oh, I'm interested, but maybe let's talk after the bowl game is not that guy's a candidate for the D right. coordinator job. That's right. just that's just not how it works. That's and a very I, and nice I, definition of candidate. Yes. And I know how this stuff works. It's agents reach out to people or coaches reach out to people. A coach may, you know, Marcus Freeman has worked with. Uh, a, a name that is out there, like you know, like for example, that I was using, Mike Trussell from from um, from Cincinnati, who's the current D coordinator. Well, when you have a situation like that, where okay, they work together, they were at this school together, there's going to be people that actually say, well, that's a candidate, maybe he is, but just because they work together doesn't mean you know, Marcus Stream may have called up Coach Trussell or may have called up another coach he worked under and said, hey. This is what I'm looking for. I need some help on this, 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 and this. And they had a conversation about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that guy interviewed for the job. It just means they had a comp. It could have been just a, a veteran coach giving advice to a younger protege. Uh, and then by, oh, and by the way, if this is a job you'd be interested in, just let me know. Right. Right. So I just, I know how this game works and it, and it happens all the time. And sometimes it's, hey, listen, let's talk, you know, like, here's what I want to do. And, and I just want to be fair to the people involved. I, I don't know who the D coordinator is going to be. And as far as I know, as of last night, Marcus Freeman has not decided who the D coordinator is going to be. Who it should be, 
that's also something I'm avoiding. And, and I did this with the O-line thing. Even though my top candidate was Harry Heastand for obvious reasons, the re- what we said was there's a lot of good O-line coaches out there. Exactly. And the key is that Mark, that Tommy Reese and Marcus Freeman hire a great O-line coach. If it's Harry Heastand, phenomenal. If it's not, so it so Could be it. Could still be phenomenal. I mean, that, and that's – right. When you put a name out there, and this is just how it works, if you put, let's say, let, let's use that Harry Heastand example, right? So if you would have said, Harry Heastand's my guy, that's who I want. If it doesn't end up being him, then it looks like it's a disappointment. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. they, they, oh, they failed. They didn't get the guy I want. Right. Like, so us speaking it out there doesn't necessarily right. do the right thing. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I could name five or six guys that I think would be good. I could say, look, man, I really like John Heacock at Iowa State. Right. That's a name that's been thrown around the last two times that Brian Kelly's been looking for a D coordinator. He's a guy that coached that Marcus Freeman coached with at Ohio State. Really easy to say that would make sense. And then I could jump on the John Heacock. And the only reason I'm throwing that out there is because John Heacock's been mentioned for this job many times in the past as well. And there's an obvious connection. So I'm using him as an example. Right. And I said, that's my guy. And that's who I want. And then I came on the show and I pushed for John Heacock. If they hire anyone other than John Heacock, it's going to be seen as a disappointment because right. some people are going to take that and they're going to do their research and they're going to be like, boy, that's a really good coach. And then it's going to seem like a letdown. Right. Here's the reality. There's a lot of guys out there that Marcus Freeman could go hire to be his defensive coordinator, including one guy on staff who I think could do a great job. There's some guys that I've seen their names mentioned that if that was the hire, I'd be disappointed. But the reality is, as long as he hires someone who fits the job and can do right. a great job, I don't care who it is. Right. They have to be great teachers. They have to be great play callers. They have to be great designers of game plans. And they have to be good, like strong recruiters. I'm not as concerned with the D coordinator being elite recruiter because that's what Marcus Freeman can do. Mm-hmm. He just has to be willing to do work on recruiting. But it, he's got to be a great teacher. He's got to be a great game planner and a great play caller and, and be able to maximize the potential of the players around him. And then obviously, as Marcus Freeman said yesterday, he's got to fit with the current staff because the new D coordinator is inheriting a ready-made staff. And if he has illusions of kind of building his own thing, then that's that's yeah. not going to work well. That's where fit comes right. into play, right? I mean, if he's going to be like, I need yeah. my own D-line coach, it's going to be like, well, okay, you can have your own D-line coach somewhere else. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, that's just how it's going to go. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's why I'm saying who should be Freeman's D coordinator. It's not a name. It's it's this is the skills. This is the ability that that person needs to have. And and I will evaluate whoever he hires with that criteria. And I will determine I will determine if I think it's a good hire or not. I'll share with you all your my opinion. And then hopefully you can do your own kind of thought of whether you agree or disagree with me based on the criteria that we've established. Good teacher, great game planner, you know, great play caller, willing to work in recruiting and works with the current staff. Well, right. He does that then, you know, and again, there's not one guy that fits that better than everybody else. And if there was, then I'd tell you, (laughs) say, look, if he doesn't go hire so-and-so, then this is a no, I mean, it's same thing with every other position, hire a good coach, Mm -hmm. right? And that's that's the reality of it. So, next super chat from DJ. Thank you so much, DJ, for the super chat. Really appreciate it. it says Merry yeah. Christmas, fellas. Thanks for everything you do. Go I feel Irish. Like that was our Christmas present from DJ. I, I, I I'll love take it. it. I, I love it. Take it. That is awesome, DJ. Thank you very very much, uh, Debezy. Uh, jumping in. Thank you very much for the super chat. Have you heard good things about Xavier Watts in the bowl practices? Coach Freeman spoke highly of him. I mean, I've heard what you've heard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. That that's yeah. It's closed. But, so yeah. But honestly, that's what we've heard since he's moved to safety. I mean, we've yeah. talked about this, uh, Doy, on our show before it, it, about this, which is from the minute he moved to safety, Coach Freeman said something yesterday in in the the video where he talked about how the kid just makes plays. That's where we've heard the minute he moved to say. I mean, literally, I heard about one practice, like one of his. I, I think it might have been his first week or second week playing defense. We had like three or four interceptions in one practice. Well, if you know he's working as the number two and three guy, he's not getting a ton of reps. So to make mm-hmm. like three or four interceptions in one practice, that means he's just just making plays. And that's been the thing. Now, the reason he hasn't played quite as much as other guys is because he's still learning the position. Sure. He'll make a play one play and then be out of position the next. Well, in a game, that being out of position results in a 60-yard touchdown. 
<laughs> and so that's the part where Xavier's got to grow his game, but he's been so good. They're like, we've got to get him on the field. We've got to get him on the field, but then just be smart about what you're asking him to do. And right. then with more experience and then you go into the spring, then he's going to be a hard guy to keep off the field. Mm -hmm. But that's the big thing is you just hear about him. Like the kid just makes a ton of plays. He's just a natural football player. And we said this when he signed that, you know, this is a kid that, that Clark Lee tried to recruit to come play safety. Like when Notre Dame was recruiting him, it was, it was as much, you know, I remember when somebody did like a crystal ball for Nebraska and I laughed because he had already committed to Notre Dame. It just hadn't gone public yet. It was always going to be Notre Dame for a, for a long time. The question was who was going to win his recruitment. It wasn't about Notre Dame, Michigan, Iowa state or Nebraska. It was about Chip Long or Clark Lee. <laughs> that was, that was, X always wanted to be a receiver. Yeah. But he loved, he was a great defensive. He, he was probably in, as good of a safety as he was a receiver in high school just because he's so instinctive and, and, but you know, I loved him at receiver. I think he was a really could have been a really dynamic modern receiver. Didn't work out that way. Now he's got a chance to be a, a really big player at safety. But I mean, that's, that's what we've heard. Doy is just about how he just makes a ton of plays, but he's still learning the position. And I think that's also what you could kind of glean from coach Freeman's comments that there's still, there's still work to be done when it comes to learning the position, but the kid's got a, a ton of, ton of talent and potentials. There's no doubt about it. I believe uh, that we debunked uh, this particular thought process, uh, but I want to put it up anyway because he gave us a super chat. So thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. He said, uh, Harry Heastan would be a bad choice. He doesn't recruit, and I thought that was Freeman's top criteria. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that that's said by some people. I don't I don't know where that comes from. It, it People have taken he didn't like to recruit. You know what Harry does does Harry Heastan doesn't like to get on the road and talk to teenagers and and this is what all the kids that were here he's like he doesn't do the typical recruiting thing he doesn't call and try to pretend like he's my buddy he he call, he tells this is what I can do for you and this right. is what I think you can do for us he goes after it in an old school right. way I mean right and he gets it done I mean do I really need to list text yeah. you all the time either right I mean, do just... I really need to list all the kids that he signed at Notre Dame right I mean do I really need to go there and do that. Uh, say he doesn't recruit there no that's false and and i mean i could go down a long list of guys that are, were first round draft picks second third round draft picks i mean let's not forget the last year's offensive line was recruited by harry Heastan with the exception of jarrett patterson and had harry Heastan stayed jarrett patterson wouldn't be here but you know who would have been here nicholas pettit frere and robert hainsey would have been starting center okay so i mean you can buy into that mantra all you want, Michael, and I know that there are people spinning that, but I'm just telling you, that's false. And if that were true, I would not be sitting here telling you this was a great hire because I don't know Harry Heastan personally. Other than interviewing him, I've had no relationship with Harry Heastan beyond interviewing him at media things. That's it. This opinion is based on what I've seen, how I've covered this team. When I, Because you got to remember, when he was here, I was still primarily covering recruiting. So I'm talking to recruits. This isn't just me giving you an opinion of what so-and-so told so-and-so. This is me talking to recruits. Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, like all these coaches are telling me this, 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 and this. But, you know, and the other thing, too, is he's an offensive line coach. That's a different type of kid than coaching receiver. You couldn't do it the way he does it at receiver unless you were just like at a school where you've produced third, third, you know, tw eight, eight first-round – I mean, eight first round picks and it's just kids are just beating down the door to come play for you. Right. Which right. he's actually done at offensive line, but it's a different type of kid than other positions. You can get away with it there. I wouldn't hire someone that recruits the way that Harry Heeson recruits at corner or safety or receiver or quarterback. Absolutely. But this is a different, mm -hmm. anyone that tells you that is, is just not being honest with you. Or if that's your opinion, then you're just wrong. And he has a long, long career of putting together great offensive line. Let's okay, let's just go through it. His first offensive line class that he put together had Mike McGlinchey in it. Okay. Had Steve Elmer in it, who was a three-year starter, would have been a four-year starter and would have got drafted had he, you know, had he stayed with football. Had Hunter Biven in it, who was a who was a top 100 recruit. 247 Sports had him in the top 50. And had John Montalis who was a top 100 recruit according to rivals and had Colin McGovern, who was an ESPN top 250 guy, five guys that were ranked in the top 150 by at least one recruiting service. His next class, that's his first full class. 
His first partial class had a kid named Ronnie Stanley in it. Not sure if you've heard of him before. He's average. Um, his next class had Quentin Nelson, Alex Bars, Sam Mustafer, and Jimmy Byrne, all four-star recruits. Obviously, Quentin Nelson was a five-star recruit. His next class had Jerry Tillery in it. Right? So here's the thing. You know who? You know what Notre Dame coaches recruited the most first-round draft picks on the defensive line at Notre Dame? Harry Heastan. Notre Dame's had one defensive lineman picked in the last decade in the first round. He was recruited by Harry Heastan. You had Harry Heastan, Tristan Hodge, who was a top 100 player, and Trevor Rulin, who was an ESPN 300 player. Your next class had Liam Eikenberg, who was a top 100 recruit, Tommy Kramer, who was a five-star recruit, and Parker Boudreaux. I did not like Parker Boudreaux. That was one year where Harry Heastan had a miss. He wanted Ben Breedens in bad. He thought he was going to get him, ended up losing him to Michigan. That's the only really big loss that I remember where they came up short of what their desired numbers were. He rebounds the next year with a class that had Robert Hainsey, top 100 recruit, Josh Lugg, top 100 caliber-ish recruit, Aaron Banks, top 150 recruit. And by the way, two of those three guys were second and third round draft picks, and Dylan Gibbons. All four of those kids started in college, were college football starters. 2018 we talked about, and as we mentioned in 2019 – he was the one that had Notre Dame. He landed John Olmstead, who was a top 200 recruit at the time, landed Andrew Kristoffic, and who's a starter now for Notre Dame. And, he, and Notre Dame led for Quinn Carroll and Zeke Carell, top 100 recruits, when Harry Heastan left. So for a guy that's a bad recruiter or doesn't recruit, I'll take that – His I'll take his doesn't recruit over anybody else's recruiting because you're not going to get better results than that. You're just not. I mean – the class that Jeff Quinn just and, and Tommy Reese just put together, honestly, Harry Heaston has like three or four classes like that. Look at that no. guy trying to make an appearance in the show. I, gosh. You know, the professionalism just took a deep, deep dive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, Michael, I'm just gonna have to I'm gonna have to call call uh I'm gonna have to call that one out and say that's just yeah. not accurate. Uh, we got a couple more super chats here. I want to. Can I say one oh. more thing about that? Yeah, Harry he stands not coming back into coaching in college if he know if he doesn't know that he's got to go out there and get players. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. You, you know what, Kerry Heaston likes. You know what he likes more than he dislikes recruiting. He likes coaching talented players. <laughs> no, I, yeah. coaching talented players is a real drag. I, don't, I mean, we both you know coach, so I don't know how that I feel about that. But Octavio Roca has a super chat. Thank you very much, Octavio. Uh, who do you think will be the most improved player in the bowl game? Watts, Fisher, Buckner, JT, or Estime? Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, most improved? I feel like some of those guys won't necessarily be improved. They're just going to be. They're going to have more opportunity. I don't know if if Estime plays and carries the ball. I don't mean. I don't know if that means he's improved. Yeah, right. I just think he means that got means an opportunity. A, a future NFL player is not there anymore, and he's going to have more of an opportunity. Same thing with Fisher. I mean, I. I, I really don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I, I really don't. I, I'll i tell you a guy that I've heard a lot. I've heard some things about in bowl practice. I don't know who JT is, but if he's talking about J, uh, Jaden Thomas, I've heard Jaden Thomas has had some really good bowl practices. Nice. Some really good bowl practices. <laughs> that, would, that would be an improvement because he's been hurt so much. That yeah, would be a genuine right. improvement from the no, beginning of the year because he struggled and, and, and struggled to get caught up because he missed so much time from you know not because he wasn't an early enrollee right so when right. you're not that's an early enrollee and then you're banged up in august and september you're going to be way behind yeah that's real so tough. he from what i'm from what i was told by a, a pretty good source the other day he's had some really good bowl practices and and this played really well so we'll see but uh, i didn't answer the question i guess um <laughs> most improved uh geez louise i'm gonna say Man, this is a tough one. I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna go with Lorenzo Styles. Hmm. Okay, that's who I think will show out as a guy that kind of has taken his game to another level in the bowl game. And so I, I was gonna say Watts of this group of the group that he listed. Yeah. I was gonna go. I was gonna go Xavier Watts. I I I, I think just every day he gets better and better and better. Yeah. And not seeing him for a month, yeah. I think is is really. I think you're gonna see a jump. Well, and with Ramon, with Kyle being gone, which is he's been gone, but with Ramon being banged up and missing a lot of practices, and now Litchfield, Litchfield, you said though Litchfield was at the practice. He was at, at practice correct? on the Sunday that we were there. That's all but I can. Kerry say. G is, you know, not. I mean, I would imagine that that means a lot of reps for 
right. Xavier as well. Which yeah, good point. That's going to be huge for him. Very huge for him. Corey D with the super chat. Thanks, Corey. Just got here. Was the Dell situation already discussed? What's the latest? Thank you. So, Vince, are there any more super chats after Corey's? There is one. Okay, let's come back to Corey's because then we'll use okay. Corey's as a transition to talk about the receiver situation. Love that. This is a here at he stand question from Michael. Thanks, Michael. He says, uh, why did Harry bomb in the NFL? I still remember McGlinchey going offside time and again for a whole year <laughs> when Harry was here. Michael, I mean, it's Christmas, man. I don't know why you're so negative. Uh, <laughs> McGlinchey going offside. I remember Mike McGlinchey being a consensus All-American. That's what I remember. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember Mike McGlinchey being part of an offensive line that rushed for over 300 yards for like seven straight games. Uh, I remember Mike McGlinchey being a guy that, um, you know, was a part of an offensive line that they played an 11 win USC team a few years ago, a uh, team with Sam Darnold and some other really good players. Beat that uh, and they out, rushed man. for 377 yards. I remember them, Mike McGlinchey, being part of an offensive line. Uh, that ran for 318 yards against an NC State defensive line for a team that won nine games that had all four starters get drafted in the first for one to four rounds, including a guy that was the number five overall draft pick, I believe, of his class. Um, I remember Mike McGlinchey even in 2016 being a second-team All-American during a year when the rest of the team went four and eight. Uh, were there times Mike McGlinchey made mistakes? Yeah, just like every other college football player ever in the history of college football. Uh, you know, had a big mistake against George. If you're gonna, If that's what you're going to remember – then that's a you problem, Michael, not a Harry Heastan problem. Mike McGlinchey was a hell of a college football player. He was the number yes, nine was. overall draft pick right. in that in yeah. NFL draft. He okay. was drafted to become the right tackle at right. 40, for the 49ers. Right. I mean, like, that guy was a three-year starter. He was two times he was part of a, a team that that was the best offensive line in college football. Right. Uh, I remember Mike McGlinchey being part of an offensive line in 2015 against a Stanford team that finished that year in the top five. Right. Remember that team went to went, finish the top five at the end of the year. Notre Dame rushed for 299 yards in that game. Okay. Uh, that's what I remember about Mike McGlinchey. Uh, why did he bomb in the NFL? I have no clue from what every Bears fan tells me. It had nothing to do with Harry Heastan. It had to do with Matt Nagy. Harry yeah. Heastan wanted to do things the right way. Matt Nagy wanted to do things his way. And as, as anyone that knows Harry Heastan is not going to, he's not going to take that. Yeah. And it had that in it. And from what Vince, you'll tell me, how has the offensive line played since Harry left? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know that there's a position group at, in Chicago that's played all that well, period. So right. Just so, uh, as far as Mich McGlinchey going offside time and time again, again, that's just, it's just false. I think he had like five or six false starts in a year. Okay. It's not good. And I also remember that not really being an issue the next year. Mm -hmm. Remember that being, a, I mean, there's still people that talk He's about, Liam, oh, yeah, there's still people talk about Liam Eikenberg false. So how many false starts did he have last year when he was an all American? Right. Yeah. I, you know, that's again, so, it's an over overblown. You yeah. Know, here's what I know. They, Cause here's they nicknamed him McFlinchy. Like, and, yeah. and, Oh, everybody's going to remember yeah. that now. So yeah. petty. So petty. Exactly. Uh, you know, what I know is that Harry, he coached some phenomenal offensive lines in Notre Dame. That's what I know. I know that he took an offensive line that had flipping Mike Golick Jr. And, and an injured Braxton Cave and Christian Lombard and turned it into a group that rushed for over 200 yards a game and led them to a national championship game. That's what I remember. I remember a year later with Tommy Reese. You want to talk about Jack Cohn being immobile? Had Tommy Reese a quarterback. They gave up eight sacks. Eight sacks in 2013. That's what I remember. So yep. you can choose to remember what you want to remember. I'm going to remember what it actually was and I, right. I mean no disrespect to that michael but you're clearly have some you've either bought into some than somewhere else or i'll give you the benefit of the doubt you've come to the conclusion on your own it's just i think it's the wrong conclusion and i appreciate the super chat and appreciate you being part of the show but i just think you're flat out wrong here and i mean that with with all due respect and i'm not doing it the ricky bobby with all due respect <laughs> you know what i mean like i'm not i'm not doing that i mean with all due respect i just think you're wrong and you know why else would I feel the way I feel about Harry Heastan other than that's what the that's what the film showed me for year after year after year after year. You know, I mean, yeah, no, that's what it was. I'm with you. All right, ready to transition? Yeah. So I'm gonna bring Corey's back up. Uh, he says he just you know again I'll repeat it. Uh, just got here. What is the Dell situation? Has it been already been discussed? What's the latest? Thank you. Uh, obviously, this is a topic of conversation across Irish Irish Breakdown Nation, and we understand, but we, we want to touch on it a little bit. So, 
Okay, so here is basically what I've heard about that. Now, I I believe, based on my, and this is actually, this is actually, I'm saying this because I kind of feel bad that we're always putting premium info out on the premium board, and we're not given a lot of that on the channel. So I'm going to put, this is going to be something that I have not put on the message board yet. My understanding is, is that right now, barring something, a better option coming available, that that they're not going to get rid of Dell Alexander just to get rid of him. Uh, I, I think that there are some receiver coaches that Coach Freeman would like to have, but he's not going to force the issue because Tommy Reese wants Dell Alexander's receiver's coach. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I think as as I've been very high on Coach Reese about a lot of things, I think this is one where you shouldn't allow a 29-year-old who – to be in a position where he has to, he shouldn't have to make that decision to fire somebody. Now he clearly went along with it or was the driver behind it for the offensive line. So clearly he can make it, but I, I think it's a mistake. Okay. And I'm going to get into in a second why I think some of the thought is behind it. Okay. But I believe based on some of the things I'm hearing is, uh, is, if the right person was interested in the job and they could make it work, they'd consider making a change. They're not going to make a change. Ju- they're not going to get rid of him and just say, okay, let's go find a receiver's coach. They're going to have to have somebody in the bag ready to right. go. I mean, And I can't really be too hard on that because I've said that a million times. You don't get yeah. rid of somebody unless you know. It's just like you don't quit a job unless you got a job. Like right. when you have responsibilities. I mean, that's right. just, yeah. Right. And the reason that that happened on the offensive line is because they there it was known that there were people that were interested in that job. Right. I mean, it was known. So it's a little bit of a different a different situation. Um So I I guess I, I mean that's kind of where I, I I think things are going. Part of that's based on what I've been told, part of that's just based on me trying to read the tea leaves. There 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 has not been a lot of intel about coaches they've talked to i've really only heard two names mentioned as people that they may be reaching out to and so i i don't think that they're in a hurry to just replace del alexander i personally think that's a mistake i think coach alexander has done a a poor job developing players Uh, it takes players way too long to get ready to play under coach alexander uh it, it it he his we've talked about his lack of success with younger players I don't think he he doesn't maximize the potential of this football team at receiver from a recruiting standpoint. A lot of the success they've had recruiting has been about the offensive coordinator. Not always. Tobias Merriweather had a lot to do with Dell Alexander. We've said that. If you ask Tobias Merriweather's father, it was Dell Alexander play a key role in your son's recruitment to Notre Dame, he'd say absolutely. And, and you know, it's really been a puzzling thing, Vince, because when he was hired. Early on, we advocated for that. I, I yep. loved the hire. He did a great job. I always forget, was it at Michigan State or Wisconsin? It was Wisconsin, right? I thought he did a good job. I, I so, always yeah. get it wrong. I get there's there's him and another receivers coach that I always get it wrong. And the other guy was at the other guy was at, at at Michigan State, I believe. But yeah, he was at Wisconsin from 2007 to 11. They had some nice receiving cores back then. Uh, did did a really nice job. Did a and really recruiting nice job wide receivers Arizona. to Wisconsin is not an easy task, right? I mean, and, and and well, and there was more about the development, right? I mean, exactly. they had to develop guys. I mean, that's a, that, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. you bring in like you know two three star guys and you develop them into right like, into football players. I, I mean, remember the yeah. year in 2011 where they had Russell Wilson, and you had Jared Jared Aberderis and Nick Toon were a really nice receiving core. Uh, did a really nice job with that group. You know, obviously had a, a big role in, in coaching up Jared Aberderis. Coach Alexander played a key role in that. And and so Nick Toon had some really good success under him. Isaac Anderson had some really good success under him. And so when you look at it, you say, you know, how did that guy, then he goes to Arizona State. He's got he's got some really good players there. He had the strong, was it Jalen Strong, right? And so he had at Arizona State. Uh, did a really nice job uh, coaching up Cameron Smith, who was a pretty good player there. Uh, Tim White was a guy that had some real good success there. He, uh, I believe, Coach Alexander had a role in recruiting Nikhil Harry to uh, to Arizona State because he was a freshman in 2016 when Coach Alexander was still there. So obviously, he would have played a role in recruiting him to to Arizona State. Nikhil Harry was a, a highly ranked top five star player, 
And so when he got hired to Notre Dame, it was kind of like, boy, this is this is going to be a nice job. But you know, then you go back and you, you know, I, I said played a role because if you read articles from back then, it would say Chip Long and Mike Norvell played a big role in that. But he was sure. the receivers coach, and so it was kind of puzzling why he's had so much lack of success at Notre Dame. It's been a head scratcher. Well, Chip really liked Dell and t- coach Reese really likes Dell. So clearly they like him. My issue is he's a nice guy. Everything we've ever heard of him, he's a nice guy, but the reality is, is the players don't feel they can trust him. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a fact. Problem. That's a, that big a huge problem. fact. Yeah. Now here's some things that I've been told by people in recent weeks that, uh, and, and, and part of it, I, I, I accept part of it. I don't accept. Okay. Part of it. I say, well, that's still on you. Another, uh, someone else being a certain way does not cause you to say things that aren't truthful. Here's one of the examples of why players don't trust them. One is, and this is from a, a player that just transferred, but I've also heard this from other players. He will tell you one thing about what you need to improve upon. Yeah. Then you get better at that thing and then he'll say something else. And it's always something. It's like, why didn't you tell all of this to me all at, 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 at once? And it's just always like an excuse not to play me. You tell me what I need to do, I do it, and then you tell me something else. As opposed to just saying, so-and-so is better than you right now. And keep that's working, okay. keep plugging, like, but so-and-so is he – Then he like blame them for not – well, it's because you're not doing this. It got so absurd at one point. He's like, he said to a, a kid, I was told this, that you, you're on the ground too much. Well, what does that mean? He's like, no, he just dives for too many balls. They're afraid you're going to get hurt. What? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And then you just keep hearing those things from different sources, and you're like, it's clearly going on. And here's the other problem. He would tell one player one thing, another player another thing, and another player another thing, and then act like they're not going to talk. And then they get in the locker room, and they're talking. They're like, well, why is he telling you this? He's telling me this. He's telling me this. And it's a problem. There would be times where he'd say things in the meeting room that was complete opposite of what Tommy Reese said. Not on purpose. He just – just, and then they'd go out there, and then they'd mess up, and he'd blame them. When he got ripped by Brian Kelly, he'd blame the players. I'm like, no. You told us this, uh, what, you know, and, and that's why a lot of kids don't trust them. I'm just, just being honest. This is what I'm being told. Okay. Now, one of the things I was told is a part of that was, is Brian Kelly was in Dell's head big time. Uh, I've told the story about how he was about to send a freshman into a game last year and another player made a mistake and Kelly just lost. This is during the South Florida game when they're up, what, like 45 mm-hmm. to nothing. Kid makes a mistake, and I'm not talking about Jordan Johnson making the getting the penalty. I'm just talking about a kid made a route mistake, and Brian Kelly just went off, went off on Dell, and he looks at the kid and he goes, "I don't think now is a good time to put you in." That's coaching out of fear. That's, Absolutely. I mean, I, I could use stronger words than that, but I'm not going to. That's not on Brian Kelly. That's on you. Do your job. You right. know, be con- You know, and, and and I get it. You know, hey, if I lose my job, that's fine. I, then, then, then get fired because you did it the right way. If you get fired because you did it the right way, then you know what? You're going to find another job. People want to hire you if you're that likable. And he is. So, but, you know, there he, he, like I've been told the reason that younger players didn't develop is because that was more of what Brian Kelly wanted. Okay, well, that's fine. But you're the one that still stopped recruiting young players when, when you got into the season. That's still on you. So there's a lot of people that believe if he's given the the – the edict to go out and get young players ready that he'll be able to get them ready. And they'll point to how well Deion Colsey and Lorenzo Styles played down the stretch. Okay. But why does it wait? Why do you need for guys to get injured for him to do that? That's my issue. Right. Cause that's so, what happened. Right. Because we, we, I'm sorry. And we can, we can talk about him getting those young guys ready to play until we're blue in the face but they don't play if those injuries didn't happen. Period. End of discussion. And I, and, and no one look, can I'll watch give, what Lorenzo Styles did down the stretch and tell me he shouldn't have been playing earlier. Than exactly. And look, I will give him I'll give him credit for getting those guys ready sure. and, and and coaching them up to when they're out there. I'll I mean, give him credit they for that. They showed That's up fine. talented, let's be honest. But they're not going to play if those injuries don't happen. Right. Period. Right. So, you know, it's like I give credit and then I'm taking it away. So, right. I, it, right. that, that's how I feel about it. And I you think. can't dismiss the fact that he lost two receivers down the stretch because he wasn't locked in to right. what was going on. Now, the counter argument to that could be the guy's worried about his job. He doesn't know if he's going to have a job. You know what I mean? Well, that's true of a Maureen Walker. If you, but my whole point is, this is what we said on signing day. These guys were leaning towards other places way before Brian Kelly left. A Walker is the guy we said back in August, Notre Dame was not going to get. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, we said we were talking about how CJ Williams is taking visits to USC during the season, not after Brian Kelly was fired. So you can't really use that excuse. The reality is, is Coach Alexander has not gotten the job done. Right. There are people at Notre Dame, people that used to be at Notre Dame, that that will all tell you the same thing. I have confidence in Dell Alexander. I don't. They do. If they choose to keep him, what we will do is we will give him an opportunity to go prove that he is a better coach than what he's shown to be. We will. We're not going to spend the next 12 months saying guy sucks and every time the receivers have a bad game, if there's a continued pattern of what we've seen, then we will hammer him. But if he makes improvements, then we'll, we'll, we'll give him credit for those improvements. But the reality is, is you can't blame Brian Kelly for what you did and what you said. Well, it's going to be can't. it's going to be similar to the the Quinn argument right. that we had a year ago, right? And it was, hey, we're giving the benefit of the doubt because of 2020 and and the O line improved. I mean, we know why now, mm-hmm. right? I mean, well, we, we knew then we did, Let's but it was a hey, they improved in 2020. Let's see if you know you can build on that and, and everything else, and we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. It didn't work out, and now he's not there. Right. And so if, if and we're going to treat it basically the same way. And look, right. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. That's fine. And we'll see. And But, yeah, it's not going to be – we're not taking a trip to negative town all the time when we talk about the wide receiver coach. Right, because if, if they keep him, they keep him. Right. I'm, I'm not, I, just, I have no interest in spending every show reminding everyone how much Dale Alexander no. sucks as a coach. Right. I, no interest in that. Partly because it would make this show really negative and boring, and I don't and want to be not part of that. That's not and number two, I, I'm all for giving him another opportunity. And I'm also, and it's also about Marcus Freeman. Let's be honest. Part of this is because Marcus Freeman. If if Brian Kelly was still the head coach, I would not be as willing to do this because it would just be enough. Because we have a pattern. Right. I want to give if if Coach Freeman decides to keep him, and I'm not I'm not sold that it's been decided one way or the other. All my intel says it hasn't been decided one way or the other. Yeah. Th- that if he chooses to go that route. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he clearly sees something that we don't. And let's see if he's right or not. Yeah, absolutely. But as far as the intel that we've received, I I have I don't believe that there is a de- that a decision has been made one way or the other. I don't. And like I said, depending on how some things shake out, I could see a move still happening, but I think if I ha- if I was a betting man right now, I'd put a little small dollar bet on on Dell Alexander coming back. And the longer we go without hearing anything, most is, is the and that's is the, the key. The more likely that that's going to be the case, right? So that's the intel there, and I and I do believe I do, I do believe that they have an idea of who the special teams coach is going to be. Ah, yes, yeah, special teams. But uh, I, I'm not ready to. I've p- talked about it on the message board. I'm not really say that publicly yet because uh, it's kind of gotten quiet the last several days on that. But if it's the person that I that I've been told it's going to be, it's a, going to be a very strong hire, a very strong hire. Cool. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We do have a super chat from Matt Baisley. Uh, a little off topic, obviously, but you know what? That's okay. Matt, thank you for the yeah. super chat. He says, "Do you think we missed out on Styles to Ohio State because of his brother's early season playing time? No, no. chance. I don't no. think that had anything to do with it. No, and and if and if it was used by the family as a reason, it was just it was they were looking for a reason." To right. go, right. I don't. I don't think that's going to be the case, because again, too is is if that was the case, then when his brother played more down the stretch, then he would have changed his mind, right? Because he didn't commit. He wanted to go to Ohio so, State. Yeah. I mean, right. Ohio okay. State won yeah. that recruitment, right? It's right, plain and simple. And that happens sometimes. You know, sometimes a kid just you did your best. Marcus yeah. Freeman and the staff did their best. They put for, and, and I think Sonny Styles liked Notre Dame a lot. I thought he was going to pick Notre Dame up until like the very end because I had heard nothing. Even people in Ohio thought he was going to pick Notre Dame until the very end. They just got beat on that one. Yeah. It happens. It happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and there's no blaming. I mean, it just it happens. I think that if anything, the fact that they did so well recruiting linebacker in the year before. You know, getting four guys had as much to do with that as, as the other thing. And I think the fact that he 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 didn't just wake up a week before signing day and decide he wanted to reclassify to twenty twenty two. Right. That's clearly been something they've been working on for a while. That wasn't going to happen in Notre Dame. Right. That that wasn't going to happen. And so I think I think that was a big factor as well. 
because he is now considered a 2022 right. player. And it's not easy to just Westside. overnight change and and cancel out a year of high school. Mm-hmm. Um, that that doesn't uh, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it's <laughs> very hard credits. to do that at Notre Dame. Now it's yeah. happened before. Um, Olivia Miles, the point guard for the basketball team, signed she, early. She came in a semester early. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. she she, she, so she graduated for basketball. She graduated a semester right. early, and because it was a COVID year, right. didn't even count. So right. she could play all she wanted for the that stretch yep. and it didn't even count so she's a freshman again yeah. and we're like, not going to talk huge. a lot of hoops here but man her and the other freshman central oh like are freaking nasty <laughs> that's a fun team to watch yeah okay the I, men's team mm, not so no much. comment but the yeah. women's team is fun to watch yeah. and I'll, I'll throw a plug to our guy sean styers listen to him on the radio because uh he makes it a lot of fun to listen to so uh go check out this women's team because they're going to be special not only this year like, I don't know that they're at top echelon this year, but they will be. And get in on the ground floor. Get on the bandwagon because it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So so back to the coaching hires. I think D.C., I think there's a lot of names out there. I don't have a, a good read on who that lead candidate is. I have heard strongly from different sources a different person. When I put information out, it's usually when my good sources are starting to all kind of say the same thing. Right, and, exactly. And, and they're hearing the same thing. That's when I can comfortably say, yeah, this is what I think it's going to be. The fact that my sources either A, don't know, or B, are hearing different names, tells me that that there isn't a guy right now that right. is the guy. Uh, there are some candidates out there that really attract me, like, hmm, that would be interesting. And there are some that I'd be like, oh, please don't do that. Uh, so I'm just going to wait to see until we get a little bit more of a clear view before I discuss the D coordinator job more. Special teams I like. Offensive line, if if it goes the way that we're hearing we discuss, it's going to be an absolute grand slam home grand, grand slam home run higher. Do you think, I'm going to ask you this, uh, do you think it's good to have a special teams only guy or would no. you spread it around more? I, I, I'm okay having a special teams only guy as long as he can also do something else. Okay. Like if, if, for example, let's say you have a linebackers coach and you have a special teams guy who also works with like the Rovers or a guy that can kind of help defensively, or, you know, let's say it's a guy that can kind of help with, you know, if, if you're in, I'm just not speaking Notre Dame specifically here, but just like, if you're like an, an Oklahoma and you have an inside and an outside receivers coach, they have two different receiver coaches because that's the, a lot of air raid teams do that. And your special teams guy is your slot receivers coach or your running backs coach or something like that. That's fine. Number one priority special teams, number two, but he's still helping you over here. Sure. That's sure. fine. And I, there's times totally when you can put both receiver groups together and they can go right. off with one. Like there's right. ways to, yeah, exactly. Right. I, I you like know, if that. you're doing kick, if you're, yeah, exactly. If you're doing like kick return stuff and or kickoff stuff and you, you know, the other receivers coach can take the receivers and work on some other things while the special teams coordinator slash receivers coach is doing other things. So I would like a receivers coach that, I mean, special teams coach that can do other things. I don't want a guy that just stands around during most of the practice talking to the kickers and punters and snappers. I just, I just, I don't think that's getting the most use out of your staff. Right. In my opinion, it also makes him a lot less potent on the recruiting trail. I mean, he can't be impotent on the recruiting trail. I mean, Brian Pauline had some success in the recruiting trail, but I think it's even better when you can also convince those kids to come play a certain position as well. I just, it's just, that's just my opinion. I don't think there, I don't think there's, we've had special teams coaches long enough to really say definitively that that's the case. Yeah. I just personally think I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll counter with this though, Vince. I'm more comfortable with it now with the expanded coaching staffs than I was. Now that there's 10, is that a nine? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cause you can still have five on one side of the ball, four on the other side of the ball, GAs, analysts, and a special yeah. teams coach. Whereas before when you only had nine assistants, one side of the ball was going to have to only have three coaches. And, and so like, you'd have a special teams coach that would like, kind of like Polian used to try to help with the linebacker. You remember that when it was the linebackers, oh, like right. under Charlie, it was just always kind of like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of got a kick out of watching that. You're like, Oh my God, this is embarrassing. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I would prefer it, but I'm, I'm, I'm more accepting of it now that you have the extra coaches. And the analyst roles have really helped with that too. Yeah, agreed. Because they can take some of that off the field responsibility that a, a full-time right. coach normally has. 
So I'm not, I don't crush it now if a coach decides that's what, because again, what that a coach is saying is like, that's how important special teams are to me. I have a coach whose only job is that. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm cool with it. I don't, sure. I wouldn't do it personally, but I'm, I'm not, I, it's, it's my preference is to have a guy that can coach another position, but I, I wouldn't say it's wrong to do it the other way. As long okay. as you hire a guy that's really good at it, and if they hire the the guy that I've heard, I've heard a second name associated with that position, but I, I've I've only heard it from like one person. Everybody else has told me another guy, and if that's the case, I think it would be a strong, a very strong hire. So, can I just tell you that there, one of the reasons I love the IB family is because of guys like Michael S. Right? Mm -hmm. You hammered his opinion, two different opinions, hammered him, mm -hmm. which is great. I mean, that's what we do here, right? But then he comes back with another super chat. Thank you, Michael, and says, "Thanks for your perspective. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year." Yeah. Like, dude, that's awesome. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people just turn their tail and be like, "Yeah, mm -hmm. he knows nothing," and then just be all upset. But Michael, thank you, Michael. Really appreciate that. That's that's why I love this group, man. No doubt about there, it. There's another reason I love it, and I meant to do this at the beginning, and I sincerely apologize. Uh, we have a a member of our Irish Breakdown family who is a regular listener of the show but his son kieran uh is 12 and in the last week he's lost 25 pounds Whew. they don't know why he's going in to get tests today uh they're worried about what the potential options may be and obviously whatever the case is going to be it's going to be you know as, as he put it potentially like life altering so uh we are not uh I will be praying for Kieran. I'd ask that those in our community that, that believe in the power of prayer do the same thing. Uh, 12 year old losing 25 pounds in the it's course of about good, a week yeah. is scary. Yeah. And it's like a and, third of your body weight. Most yes. likely. And, and so obviously uh, he is concerned. The family's concerned. And so I will lift him up in prayer and ask those that feel inclined to do so in our chat to tonight. And if, and if that's not your thing, I respect that, but I know that there are people that are, and we ask that they do so. So please keep Kieran uh, and his family in your prayers. The test are the the test is supposed to be, I believe, today. It's his youngest son, and he just turned twelve too. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, twenty five pounds in the last month. Excuse me, I'll make sure I'm clear. In the last month, still not good, but a little better than a week. Uh, so twenty five pounds in the last month, and so he's going in for tests today, and they're hoping to be able to find out what it is. And I think as a parent, I can only imagine Vince. As a parent, I think the not knowing what's wrong oh. has got to be worse than knowing and being able to deal with it. Dude, I, I one of my daughters had to go into the hospital a couple of years ago and just had issues and just didn't know. And like there was about 24 hours where you just didn't know. And and luckily we got it figured out. We got it cleared up. But she and I had to spend the night in the hospital together and all that. It's the not knowing, man. You You hit the nail on the head. It's like you have no control, right? Because as a parent, you're in control. And, and you know like, hey, man, you know, you're always you're always in control and when you don't have control over something and there's nothing you can do about it and you're waiting on other people to give you answers and i i i reached out to a buddy of mine who 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 has a, a child who has had all kinds of medical issues i'm like man now i understand like what you go through and i don't know how you do it and i only had to deal with it for like 24 hours right and it was a good ending for me mm -hmm. right and but it's the not knowing man it's the not knowing that will that will just eat you up inside and it makes you feel you know as the man of your house and everything right it just makes you feel powerless like it, mm -hmm. it's the worst feeling on the planet so of course prayers up to, to kieran and his family and and that is um it is something that would be heavy on my heart tonight no doubt and one of the challenges is when we do things like that which i always love to do if you ever have issues we we do consider this a family like we want you all to feel part of an irish breakdown family and we will when worse people are sick we do this all the time hey we'll pray for you we just even if it's just you want just good wishes or sympathy whatever just come to us but then we always kind of do it where it's not the end of the show we got to transition and that's always tough so i'm just going <laughs> to do it the is. best I can. Right, I uh, this is a comment from earlier. Carl Bramer says it would be funny if during the season Brian said Harry Heastan isn't walking through the that door, <laughs> and Harry Heastan ends up walking through that door. <laughs> That's a great comment, Carl. <laughs> and he's absolutely right because what we said during the season is, look, Harry Heastan's not coming back. I just want to make sure I'm clear. <laughs> if the current head coach was still the same, yeah, even if he fired Jeff Quinn and said, Harry, we want you back, Harry Heastan's not coming back to coach from Brian Kelly. Right. That's why he didn't come back in the yeah. middle of the year to help out. Right. I'm just, just telling you right now, wasn't gonna happen. there was no way Harry Heastan was coaching for Brian Kelly. So that's why I said there's no way he's coming back to Notre Dame. 
I didn't anticipate at the time that Brian Kelly was going to be gone. I would have been a lot in a lot better mood during the season. I was going to say, but you know, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it, it, this was a great, I lo- I saw, I didn't see this comment earlier. I went right past this comment, but Carl, this is, an I awesome saw it. Comment. I thought it was hilarious. This is an awesome comment. I appreciate that. Fantastic. Very, very much. So, the, yeah. so the reason we didn't bring it up earlier, you can blame Vince for that. <laughs> I told him to bring up comments about Harry Heastan and he probably right. thought he was protecting my sweet little feelings. So he didn't bring that one up. Uh, right. The producer. Yeah. In and, and there yeah. was another question that I wanted to get to that I thought was a really good question. Not about Harry Heastan. Here, here's here it is from Tom McDonald. I thought this was a really good question. Tom says, uh, "Do you think, uh, do you guys think that if Kelly left after the season and Notre Dame's administration had the time to do, not rush, search, Marcus Freeman would still have been named head coach?" It's a really good question because we lauded the fact that that Jack made the decision he did in a, in a quick way because of the college football playoff and all of those different things and the recruiting class, and so. So basically, the premise of this question is there's no college football playoff committee, right? It's just, it is what it is. You played your last game. It is. You go to a bowl game. You figure it out. So it's like 20 years ago. And the recruiting period is in February. Or Brian Kelly just waits until after the bowl game. It could mean that too. Right, right. But I I think the recruiting aspect of it, and I think the college football playoff committee aspect of it is what sped it up. Now, here's what I'll say. For me, I'll give my opinion. Uh, I think that you still would have seen the groundswell from the players and whether Jack says that it had no bearing on him or not would, you know, he can say that all he wants. It still would have entered into the conversation. Okay. I think they would have interviewed Marcus Freeman. I think he would have, they would have at least sat down and talked to him. And the, 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 the issue with Marcus Freeman is once you sit down and talk to him, you're like, yeah, you got like, I think that they still would have ended up with Marcus Freeman. I I think I think one of the mistakes that a, a lot of people have made when it comes to there was too many people buying the national narrative about Luke Fickle. And so then when you buy that national narrative, and I don't know of any of the Notre Dame media that were pushing Luke Fickle that hard, like the I, national. I don't think any were. I remember earlier on in the season his, they were saying, you know, if there's an opening, he would be a candidate. Right. But I don't remember them pushing him. That is the difference there. There, you know, I think I only remember one Notre Dame person saying Luke Fickle would be the guy if Kelly left. That was during the season, and that's someone who I kind of view as more of a national in his thought process. I than know. yes, that's exactly um, what I was thinking. Of, you so. know, but like yeah. when I think of like Agreed. Tim Priester and people like that. I we all, including us, mentioned Luke Fickle is a candidate because he yes. was. He absolutely the whole Luke Fickle is the guy was a national narrative. It was Dennis Dodd, it was Pete Thamel, it was ESPN throwing out the most asinine group of names ever, uh, without bringing up Marcus Freeman. And and so that made it seem like I feel like the way it went down from a national perspective almost is it was a disservice to Marcus Freeman. Because there became this narrative that you had mentioned, Vince, of, well, it's because the players wanted him. I almost feel like that's a disrespectful narrative. Yeah, I agree. Because it seems like, well, he wouldn't have got the job on his own merit. He only got the job because the players pushed for him. That's not true of anyone that has tied in, was anyone that was at all tied into this. Because if you'll remember, we were we were saying that Marcus Freeman was going to be a strong candidate before the whole player narrative on Twitter came out, right? Because that's what our sources were telling us. Jack always liked Marcus Freeman. Part of the reason that they made the push to bring Marcus Freeman in is because he saw him as a potential candidate down the road. When you when you find out, as we have found out more since Brian Kelly left, about where Jack Swarbrick and Brian Kelly's relationship was a year ago, it makes even more sense why Brian, why Jack Swarbrick is willing to say, hey, Let's open up the pocketbook to get Marcus Freeman here. Makes a whole lot more sense now. Yeah, absolutely. So as long as Jack Swarbrick was the AD, Marcus Freeman was going to be a strong candidate. Yes. Now, someone who is going to do due diligence and not rush into a hire, Jack Swarbrick reached out to several other coaches, had legitimate conversations with Luke Fickle and his mostly his representatives, one at least one conversation with Luke Fickle. After that, the rest of the conversations are with the representatives. What would it take to get him here? You know, what's he looking for? What's the time frame? 
And then if you like what you hear and it works, then you take it the next step and you bring them in for a formal interview. Right. Um, I've heard some things about how Luke Fickle was interviewed, whether it was him flying here, whether it was, you know, but there was a legitimate conversation between Jack Swarbrick and Luke Fickle. There was a legitimate conversation between Jack Swarbrick and at least two other people. The reason that Marcus Freeman was hired so quickly was because of the recruiting class. Mm -hmm. But Marcus Freeman was hired quickly because not because of the recruiting class, but because that's who Jack Swarbrick thought was going to be the next head coach. If this process would have dragged out another month, it I think it still ends the same way. But I think it would have been a tougher choice then because you'd have lost your entire staff. Yeah. You'd have lost a big chunk of your recruiting class. And it would have it would have been a, a much tougher job for Marcus Freeman because he yeah. would have to oh. basically bring in a whole new coaching. There'd be like right. one coach left, maybe two. Mickens and, and O'Leary might be the only ones that would have stayed. Because I think Mickens would have stayed just knowing that his friend was and and guy that he's worked with is still getting interviewed for the job. But Coach Elson would have been gone. Reese would have been gone. Lance Taylor'd be gone. There'd be a lot of guys gone. And so the the timing of it was not so like I, I think the thing we got to understand, Tom, is and, and he says rushed. It wasn't rushed, it was sped up. When I think of rushed, I think of you didn't necessarily do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to hurry up and make a, we kind of panic into a decision. That's not what happened here. What happened here was you have a situation where they had, okay, this is the time frame we'd like. This is the time frame we have. Okay. They worked within a time frame that they had. However, if Marcus Freeman's interview, I think it was a Wednesday. If his interview that Wednesday doesn't go well, they don't have a head coach that week. Right. They Jack was ready to drag this thing out beyond the 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 bowl games if it meant making the right hire. Marcus Freeman's hire was expedited. It wasn't rushed. At the end of the day, as long as he wanted the job, I think he still would have been the pick. And so I think it's a very good question, Tom. I think it allows us to kind of look at some of the behind the scenes yeah. stuff of it. But I think Marcus Freeman would have still been the head coach if the process was dragged out even longer. Having said that, it would not have been as strong of a hire immediately because Marcus Freeman would have to start over from scratch putting the staff together. Right. That would have made the transition a lot rougher. Brian Kelly was trying to make it rougher by hiring all the assistants away from Notre Dame and then putting timeline – because, see, Brian Kelly knew – that Jack Swarbrick was going to probably make a move quick, which is why Brian Kelly put deadlines on Reese, Elston, and, and Freeman to take the job. He was trying to force them into rushing to leave to come to LSU because I think he knew that Swarbrick – I think he knew that Swarbrick, how, how Swarbrick felt about Marcus Freeman. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he knew. And so he's trying to make sure that Notre Dame – he wanted to take Elston. He wanted to take – he wanted to take – He wanted to weaken Notre Reese. Dame as much yes, as possible. 100%. I'm, There's no I'm question confident because... of that. Because look, he wants to, I mean, any coach, and I'm, I'm not I'm not even saying this about Brian Kelly specifically, but any coach who leaves a program, he wants to be the missing link. Like he yeah, I mean, to a degree. That's not how I felt during the season. We had talked about this before, Vince, and I felt like when Brian Kelly chose to walk away, he would look at what happens next as part of his legacy. Cause I kind of felt like he when he left, he was gonna leave to go coach to not go coach somewhere else, but to you know get into the TV or booth or something. I didn't think he was after the season going to leave to take the LSU job. Sure. So I'm going to be honest. I'm, I am surprised that he tried to hurt Notre Dame on his way out the door. As I've learned things over the last month, you start to understand why he went the petty route because number one, Brian Kelly's always been petty, but number two, he felt he wasn't being respected by Notre Dame. Which yes. Is just Cause he didn't insane. get a new contract. That's, and so because yeah. he left, he, he wanted them to see, mm -hmm. say, okay, yeah, let's see how you do without me. Mm -hmm. That's not how I felt he was going to leave Notre Dame. I'm shocked that he left Notre Dame with that feeling after. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have an article coming out about this soon, either tomorrow or Monday, uh, about how Brian Kelly's uh, comments about Notre Dame just show exactly why Brian Kelly failed to win a championship here. Because he thinks it was about him, when oh, in yeah. reality it was more about Notre Dame. And, I, and I'm going to point that out. And it just uh, it's it's going to be an interesting article. Uh, yes, very interesting article. So, but end of the day, I still think Marcus Freeman would have been the higher. I do. 
We do have a super chat from Corey. Brian, can you tell us who the other two guys were that ND reached out to? If it violates journalistic ethics and integrity, I do understand. I'm not comfortable putting those names out. I haven't even put those out on the message board just because, again, the nature of the conversations was just more of a Notre Dame reaching out about, hey, are you interested in it? Let's talk. You know, it never went anywhere. So I don't really feel like it would it, it, it would be right to put those names out because those guys are still head coaches at other programs. And um, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't, they were good coaches, but I just think Marcus Freeman was better in my and opinion. I, I do want to put, you know, somebody said that the national media was spinning that Fickle turned down Notre Dame. No. You can't turn down something that was never offered Correct. to you. And they only made one offer, to my understanding. Right, and, and so the thing about that is, and this is kind of goes back to the conversation about Justin Fry. People saying, "Well, Justin Fry was the number one choice, and he turned him down." That's not really how those things go. Right. You all, when you have a list of guys you like, and you're doing, and you're in the process of doing your due diligence, you're always going to have conversations about, okay, what would it take? You know, hey, what if we offered this? Would that be something that you think you can work with? Because what happens is, is if you have two coaches that you like. One's going to cost you $10 million and one is going to cost you $6 million. And the guy making $10 million is not going to budget all coming down from $10 million. And guess what? You're going to hire the guy at $6 million. Anyone would do that. Right. And then you're going to use that extra $4 million to reinvest into your program and to build other things up, right, or to hire better coaches or whatever the case may be. And so those conversations are always going to happen if you have multiple candidates you like. Now, if there's only one coach that you're even considering, then then, then it's not. So – were there conversations about what Luke Fickle's time frame was? Yes, there were. Uh, what he would kind of need to be taken away from Cincinnati? Yes, there were. Yeah, Does absolutely. that mean that he was offered the job and turned Notre Dame down? No. If Notre Dame calls a school, you know, I, I know this for a fact. There was a coach that uh, Notre Dame reached out to at a school, not anything like Notre Dame's, at a smaller school. And they asked him, would you be interested in in this job? And he said, no, I'm happy where I'm at. Some coaches don't want to be at a place like Notre Dame. They're happy being at a – like, this is not the coach, but like a Gary Patterson at TCU. Texas went after him multiple times, and he always said no because he's like, I don't want to coach at Texas. I like where I'm at now. I like not that I don't have the same – have to deal with the same booster headaches that the coach yeah. at Texas has to deal yeah. with or the same – I can just be a coach here. There are some coaches like that. And that's totally fine, and that's what one coach did. But that guy didn't turn Notre Dame down. They just asked, as they're putting a list of candidates together, would you be interested in, in talking about this job? And he said, I'm not really interested. Right. That's it. Well, doesn't mean, spin it however well, you check want, that but, guy yeah. off the list. We were right. going to hire him over Mark. Right. No, that's <laughs> right. not what it was. It was like an – Jack Swarbrick, had, and for, that's what's funny when Jack Swarbrick said, I didn't have a list, of, a, a list of people to reach out to. Yeah, he did. That's why he was able to reach out because so he reached out right to him. That's right. <laughs> right. 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 It wasn't but, just like, hmm, who should yeah. I call next? You know, but yeah. I just I don't really I don't really think it's important to to, to put the names out there. Number one, because the decision has been made. Number two, the people that told me the names didn't want me to say it publicly. And so I'm not going to say it publicly because there's only two people told me those names. I trust both of them very, very much. But they both asked that I keep it between us. Now, I was allowed to say what happened, but I just couldn't say who was involved. And so, um, but it, it really doesn't matter. They were not guys that ultimately were going to get the job that it was, it was going to be fickle or Freeman and Freeman yeah. from everything I've been told was Freeman was going to have to lose the job. Mm -hmm. Yep. More that's than what, that's a great way to put I'm it. Told. That's a great way to put it because he'd have to do something to, to, to make yeah. Jack say, yeah, that's just, it, it's right. And he because not only didn't high, do that. I mean, he was right. second. I mean, there's right. no, you know, Freeman did not only do that, but he eased Jack. The, he eased the concerns Jack did have right. in that interview. Because what I what I what I've gathered is, even though I think it always was going to be Freeman, Jack was not going to make the decision that first week. Right. He he was not planning on doing that. He was gonna. He wanted to interview some candidates, even though Freeman I think was always the guy. It was that second interview because they met right away, like in a, an informal conversation, and then they had the formal interview on that Wednesday. I'm told going into that, Jack was not anticipating offering Marcus the – this is just what I was told, you know, from good – Jack didn't go into that meeting thinking by the end of the meeting he was going to – he was by the end of the interview he was going to offer Marcus the job. That was not my understanding. It's just that's how 
that's how good Marcus did. Now, here's the thing. For someone that you've known for a year to blow you away that much, yeah, that had to be really impressive. That's saying something. But really I'm impressive. not surprised. I'm sorry. I'm not surprised just based on hearing him talk. I yeah. mean, hearing him talk with passion in his voice and conviction. And, like, that doesn't surprise me in any way that he would sit down in an interview, even with people that he knew, and blow them away. I mean, obviously, specifically Jack Swarbrick. But that – it just doesn't surprise me. It just doesn't, which – is saying a lot about who Marcus mm-hmm. Freeman is. We have a couple more super chats here. Uh, David, thank you for the super chat. He says, just became premium after listening literally from the start. Don't wait like I did. Join now. This really is a family proud to be a part of it. I well, think David Trudeau, awesome, David. thank you for that very, very much. I think that's awesome, Very, David. very much. I welcome. appreciate that. You've been part of the family, but welcome to the premium side yeah. of the family as well. Yeah. John. With the super chat, thanks, John. Uh, he says, "How does the twenty-two O line job compare to the previous years?" Harry Heastan was at Notre Dame. What is the level of difficulty? Well, John, you know, you brought up a great point about this yesterday on the message board. John, John started a message board post about this, and 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 the interesting thing is, there's a chance that that next year's offensive line is going to have three true sophomores. I don't think. Harry Heastan has ever coached a Notre Dame offensive line that had that many young players in it. If I were to say one criticism that I've had two things about Harry Heastan that I've, I've, I've had criticisms of him at times at times. And we've talked about these at times. I felt like his lines could be a little too aggressive, which would hurt them a little bit in pass pro at times. We've talked about that. And, and at times it, it would, I mean, you know, again, Quentin Nelson didn't play as a freshman. Right. Like right. Zach Martin didn't play. Well, Zach Martin wasn't under here. He stand, but like Ronnie Stanley didn't play a ton as a freshman, you know, like he ended up red shirting with an, an injury. And so it's a different era. He's going to have to learn to coach young players. Now, the good news is, is his last year at Notre Dame, he played a red shirt freshman and a true freshman at right tackle. And he played Robert Hainsey because Robert Hainsey just was ready to play. I mean, it, it, they didn't go into that season saying, hey, let's, we got to, got to find a way to get Robert Hainsey on the field. No. He had Liam Eikenberg was a sophomore. Liam Tommy Kramer was a sophomore. He had older players. It just Robert was just that good. So he clearly showed he's willing to get younger guys ready to go. It's just that was a thing where he's going to have to be more willing to accept young people mistakes if it means getting a Blake Fisher on the field early, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so I think that's going to be an adjustment for coach, and that's going to be right away if he takes if he gets the job and he ends up being the hire there's a good chance you're going to have three true sophomores in the starting lineup next year. Joe Walt, Blake Fisher, and Rocco Spindler. There's a chance that that's going to – you're going to have at least two. And as I think back through it, I can't remember him ever having that many young players in the lineup. Yeah. That is going to be a challenge. Now, the challenge is going to be about can you get consistency from it? Can you get them to play with the force that you want? Because a lot of young players – aren't strong. The exciting thing for me, and we talked about this on the message board as well. And this is something that, what was it, about four or five days ago, I brought up on the message board because a buddy of mine said it to me. Harry, he stand only coached with Matt Bayless one year. Yeah. 2017. I've this. Yeah. That's a really good point. And that happened to be a really, really dominant year for the Notre Dame's offensive line. But Harry, he stand was an offensive line coach during the tenure when they really didn't have very good offensive – I mean, uh, special team – I mean, uh, strength and conditioning program. They had issues. I mean, they yeah. had legit issues yeah. in that in that regard. Yeah. And so what's it going to be like when you've got a guy like Matt Bayless? And that's a part of the conversation too. But it's still going to be a young group, and and that's going to be a challenge for him. It, you know, Harry, he stands a guy that strives for perfection. When you have three sophomores in your starting lineup, you are you can still strive for that, but you – have to treat that when they fail that when they meet when they fail that standard as as all lines will they're going to fail to meet that standard a lot more than a 2017 offensive line that has fifth year senior you know mike mcglinchey senior quentin nelson senior alex bars senior sam mustafer that you're just going to have to deal with that you know where that year they had one young position right tackle and they could protect it this year you're going to have at least two maybe three young guys which means they're going to make more mistakes Right. He's going to have to – he's going to – now, look, that doesn't mean you lessen your expectations, but how you react when those things happen is going to have to be different when you have a young group. I think that that's going to be an important thing for him. That's going to be an adjustment for him compared to what he's had to deal with in the past because in the past, 
he did a better job of developing veteran players where you didn't need young players to step up and be ready. That's number one. Number two, he didn't, you know, he didn't have a lot of Blake Fishers. And, and when he did have a Blake Fishers, those guys played as redshirt freshmen, AKA Quentin Nelson, Ronnie Stanley. Those guys all were starters by year two. Steve Elmer's a guy that played a bunch as a freshman and was a starter by year two. So he was, he's shown that he can coach red shirt freshmen. We've seen him get those guys ready. It's, it's the, the first year guy. So, you know, we've seen some of his best lines 2015. That was a great offensive line. You had a red shirt freshman as your left guard. He got injured. Another red shirt freshman, Alex bars replaced him and you were still really, really good. Mm Mm-hmm. And so he's had to do it, but it's always been like one guy, maybe a second guy, but it's been one guy. It hasn't been three of them. Right. That's the difference. Because he hasn't needed to, because he's always done such a better job of developing players. John Dirksen would be a way ahead of, you know, I think would be ahead of, I don't know this for a fact, but I think John Dirksen would have been a much better player had Harry He stand stayed. I you know, I mean, Andrew Kristoff, Zeke Carell would be a better player if, with, if Harry He stand would have, would, have, would have stayed. So those are the things you, you, that you look at. But that's the reality of this team is it's going to be a young starting lineup. Not Brian Kelly young, like sixth-year senior, fifth-year senior, senior, <laughs> junior young, but like actually young, like three sophomores in your starting lineup. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Oh, I, I do have another I, super chat I want to bring up, Vince. I love you, Brian. All right, Anthony L., thanks for the super chat. Anthony says, three-parter. Oh, three-parter. A, loved the Buckner article. B, still considering doing an IB tailgate at all home games next season. And C, uh, Brian, who now who now is the number one target on your recruiting board. Are you talking about – so just real quick, Anthony, if you could follow up while I'm answering the other part of your – the other things, um, parts of your question. Uh, are you asking – I'm just making – because, like, we're like doing who's a higher at Irish breakdown. Yeah. Are you talking about that or are you talking about like for the, the 2022 or 2023? Just kind of curious where you're coming from on that one. Uh, so three-parter, love the title of the Buckner article. Um, not sure. Oh, I think you talking about the breakdown that we did maybe. I don't know. Uh, still considering doing an IB tailgate at all home games next season. Yes, we are strongly considering that. I think right now we're leaning towards that. It's just not – we won't necessarily have like big spreads at every one. Just more kind of gathering and – you know, bring drinks and hang out, talk ball kind of thing. And then maybe a few of the the night games, we will do like a big spread and grill and do all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, I think we are, we are leaning towards that uh, next year. We're also, I'm also trying to find a place in Phoenix on the 31st right. yeah. that we're all going to meet up at. So Vince and I'll both be there in Phoenix on the 31st. We're going to try to find a sports bar to ha- like eat at time. and relax. And no, we're going to do it earlier. Cause I just thought about this. The the playoff games, Vince start at one thirty and four thirty Pacific or mountain time. Gotcha. So I'm thinking about since it's New Year's Eve, might want to start earlier. So maybe like 1.30 when the first game kicks off, kind of watching that game and gotcha. hanging out during those gotcha. games. We'll talk about that. Yeah. So that's what that's what that's where we're leaning towards. So if you're going to be in Phoenix on the 31st, we're looking to find a sports bar where we can meet up. I'm going to try to make some four, more phone calls today. Uh, I think I found a place that I'm hoping will let us kind of reserve some space. But if you're uh, if you're thinking about that, please come by. We're not doing a tailgate. The game's at eleven o'clock. I'm not doing a tailgate before the game, uh, to be honest with you. But we are going to try to meet up on the thirty first in Phoenix. So be be ready to um, be ready to do that. So, oh, he the, said the article regarding how the future quarterback is already on the roster. So it was the article I wrote about you know the tra- when the transfer portal stuff was happening and people. Were, I said, look, Notre Dame's future quarterback's already on the roster, not not in the transfer portal. And then so. his last part, it's either 22 or 23. Yeah, 22, I don't think there is a top guy on the board right now. I think they're trying to find some receivers that they um, that they can get. There's a kid that we put on the board the other day, uh, St- Stephon, I think it's Steven or Stephon Johnson, S-T-E-P-H-O-N. I don't know because some people pronounce that Steven. Some people pronounce that Stefan. So, and well, and one guy that we know of pretty famous pronounces it Stefan. So, um, uh, right. Isn't that how Steph Curry's name is, right? Isn't it so, Stefan? Yeah. Uh, or is it yeah, Stefan? Yeah. No, so he I thought goes it was by Stefan. Stefan. He goes by Stefan. So uh, the point being is he is a guy from Texas that I really like. I don't know if he's the top guy or not, though. 
in 2023 until Dante Moore is not a recruit is either committed to Notre Dame or commit somewhere else. That's always my answer for 2023. Yeah, absolutely. Always going to be my answer until, until he is committed somewhere. Dante Moore will be my number one answer for that. Just yep. always going to be that way. Uh, Ronnie, thank you for the super chat. Merry Christmas, fellas. It seems we are an elite quarterback away at times from taking that next step. How can this new staff close the gap at quarterback and avoid what happen- happened with Jakovic? Well, do a better job communicating with players, number one. Uh, coach your entire depth chart. And honestly, I think Tommy Reese is a lot more of a mature coach now than he was then. That's fair. I think that's a really That fair was statement. the 2019 season. He was 27 years old. He's been a coordinator for two years. I mean, look, that's the growing pains. I have done, I have said and done dumb things when I was a young coach. We Everyone does. And you learn from it. Like, <laughs> right. I probably yeah, shouldn't no have done doubt. that. Did some really uh, stupid your, stuff. Your, your filter me. gets a little bit, you know, better as yes. you get older. Facts. So, uh, I think that was a mistake he made and I would imagine he would probably do things a little differently. Not that he would have more faith in Phil Dracovic. I just think at the end of the day, Tommy Reese doesn't think Phil Dracovic's that good of a quarterback. I think he's wrong, but it is what it is. Uh, I think how he handled it would be better. I think as far as what they need to do to develop and cl- the, close the gap, coach up the kids you have. And, and that's going to result in you being, if you, here's the deal. Tyler Buckner is the key to the future of the Notre Dame quarterback position. And what I mean by that is, number one, you've got – he's a top 50 recruit. If you can't develop a top 50 recruit, people are just like, you just – you just this is as in the school I want to go to. And my dad asked me this all the time, why would a top quarterback go to Notre Dame? I said, my only response is because it's Notre Dame. Right. And that's the only reason that you have. It's not because, like, oh, wow, this track record of success. It, it, but you've got to change that narrative. And Tyler Buckner's your first opportunity to do that. Now – if you get Dante Moore and Tyler doesn't step out, then there's even more pressure on Dante Moore. But to me, you develop Tyler Buckner this year, it's going to make it even easier to get a, Tyler, a Dante Moore or in the future years that that caliber player. You have to prove you can produce this. Like, yeah. why did Clemson all of a sudden start getting top quarterbacks? Because of because of the, the they started developing, and it didn't start with Deshaun Watson. It actually, in my opinion, started with Taj Boyd. Because Taj Boyd was a top recruit. He went to Clemson, had a lot of success. They started winning some of those big games, right? They went out and beat Ohio State. You know, they beat Oklahoma in a bowl game uh, when Deshaun was a freshman. They beat Ohio State in 2013. Taj Boyd led them to a win over LSU in 2012. That had a big impact on them going out and beat, getting Deshaun Watson. And, sure. and, and then, of course, Deshaun then steps up, right? So Taj leads them to an Orange Bowl win over, over Ohio State. Next year, Deshaun comes in. He's having a good freshman year, gets hurt. They lose a couple games. The Colts out a quarterback. Deshaun comes back. They go beat Oklahoma in a bowl game. And then the next year, of course, as a sophomore, they play for the championship because of Deshaun. I mean, if Deshaun Watson's not on that team in 2015, they're not playing for the championship, and they don't win it in 2016. That then leads to you getting Trevor Tyler, Trevor, Trevor Lawrence, which then leads you to getting DJ Vince. Uwe Ongalale. And so forth and so on. And now you're getting Cade Klubnik, who's my number one quarterback in the 2022 class. But it has to start somewhere, right? It has to start somewhere. And for Notre Dame, it hasn't started yet. Yeah. Tyler Buckner needs to be that guy. If Tyler Buckner becomes the quarterback we think he is, it's not just good for the current team, Ronnie. It's good for the future. Right. But Absolutely. that's the key. Is no, And so how do you do that? Have faith in them. Teach the fundamentals. Find out what makes the kids tick. And then, of course, put talent around him and make sure that you're asking him to execute an offense of things that he's good at and comfortable with. And don't start doing having him do those other things until he until you coach him up to be better at them. You do that, you know, then you're going to be all right. And Br- Brandon asks, "Who's Deshaun Watson? Is he in the NFL play or something?" No, not in the NFL uh, right currently. now. We, we just we, we only know of the guy that played for Clemson. Yeah, that's so right. Yeah, I don't exactly. know about the NFL guy. I don't watch yeah. the NFL. I tell y'all, uh, I don't watch <laughs> the NFL. But uh, yeah, we're talking about the college version. <laughs> Of Deshaun Watson. Hey, we got one more here, and I think this is a great way to wrap it up. Brian Lucas Chapman, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, Merry Christmas, fellas. Your live streams are always the highlight of my day. Thank you. You are welcome. Very well. And I believe, yeah, I believe somebody else uh, said that they were wrapping gifts while listening to us, which is awesome. And he's better than Christmas carols. So, yep. I think that's awesome too. I think it was Tommy. I think yeah. it was Tommy that said that. But anyway, there was a couple other things I want to get to, Vince. Okay, uh, here real quick. No, please do. One was about the quarterback position, and and here here it is. 
Alan Krentz asks, oh. can you read that question, Vince? Yeah. Yeah, he says, not getting a, ND getting a special teams coach and not getting a QB special coach, only coaching quarterback. Doesn't Alabama have a quarterback coach? Yes, they have a quarterback coach. His name's Bill O'Brien. He's also the offensive coordinator. Last year, they also had a quarterback's coach named Steve Sarkeesian. He was also the quarterback's coach. Uh, before that, they had a quarterback's coach named Lane Kiffin, who was also <laughs> the, the, offensive uh, coordinator. the offensive coordinator. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that uh, the guy they had before that uh, was also, I'm trying to remember, uh, I'm trying to find Brian Dabble. I believe he was also uh, the offensive coordinator and um, uh, um, I think Dabble was what, 2017? He's now the OC for the Bills. Yes, Brian Dabble was also the quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator. So the last four offensive coordinators that, that Steve Sarkeesian has hired, or I mean, excuse me, that Nick Saban has, has hired, were also the uh, the quarterback coaches. So uh, I understand that there's some former Notre Dame players who I respect and appreciate that think that they you need a quarterback's coach. That's fine. I think it's a personal preference thing. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. It's your personal preference. Right. I have zero problem with Tommy Reese being the quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator. Me personally, my personal preference is that if if you can find an OC that is also a quarterback's coach, I prefer that. Me too. I just do. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, in my opinion, the, the way to go. That's just That's just how I feel about it. Now, again, I realize that there are other people that don't feel that way. That's fine. I respect that. I don't think that they're wrong. I just think it again. I, I don't think there's it's a right a or wrong of way. Yeah, opinion on how to build yeah. a staff. I mean, that's right. It's all going to be up to the head coach and how he wants it done. I mean, that's right. Right. From a from a practice planning standpoint, when you are the offensive coordinator and you are the quarterbacks coach, that means you can do both at the exact same time because mm-hmm. you don't have to move around. It's much more difficult to do like what Chip did, being the tight ends coach and the offensive coordinator, in my opinion, mm-hmm. because sometimes the tight ends are going with the offensive line and 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 you're not with the passing game. And you now and, you have know. more voices in the ear of your quarterback. Exactly. So for me, I if I'm the offensive coordinator of a team, right, I want to be the quarterback's coach. Yeah. Okay. When I was offensive coordinator for a high school team, granted, it's not the same. I didn't have a position, right? And so I hung out with the quarterbacks and I hung out with the offensive line. I mean, that's that's where I went. Uh, because that's when you you have the biggest bird's eye view of the whole thing when you're with the quarterbacks and you just do mm-hmm. so. Uh, and again, it's voices in the quarterback's ear. That's right. huge to me. Now, huge. Clemson won two titles with two different quarterbacks, and in both games, their offensive coordinators were co-coordinators that coached receivers and running backs. They didn't have a quarterback. It can and be that's double. fine. Like yeah, I said, it's, there's not a right or wrong way. Yeah. It's about Vince is not telling you the right way to do it. Vince is telling you how he likes it. Exactly. I yeah. tend to agree with it. Not everything in football, and, and this isn't what Alan's saying at all. I'm just making this is just a statement of of yeah. my opinion. Not everything is right or wrong. There's no right, right way to run an right. offense or right where you have to fix it. You have to find a way that works, and there's multiple ways that work. Yes. It, it's it's when I when Notre Dame wasn't running an offense I liked, it wasn't that, oh, it's the wrong offense, just in theory. It's just it didn't work. It doesn't work. It you right. know, find one that works. And there's multiple things you can do that work. Just find something that works. I personally am totally fine with it. And if you're going to use Alabama as your example, then that's a great example to support what Notre Dame is doing. Because I believe, like I said, going back to tw- in 2016, you could go to 2015. Alabama, I believe, was also uh, Steve. Sorry, was also Lane Kiffin too, correct? And Lane Kiffin was obviously, like I said, he was the he was the quarterbacks coach. So, uh, you know, if if you're trying to be like Alabama, then the reality is is their quarterbacks coach is also their offensive coordinator and has been for mm-hmm. a long time. I believe Doug Nussmeyer was as well when they won it in 2012. Uh, Jim Doug Nussmeyer was the offensive coordinator that year. I believe he was also the quarterbacks coach. I'm not 100 percent certain on that, but I believe he was. So uh, the there's no right or wrong way. You just have to find the way that works for you and what you're comfortable mm-hmm. with. And then you got to make sure you got the right coach. Right. Yeah. Doug Nussmeyer was also the offense was the uh, offensive was in 2012, 2011, I think was the only exception. Let me go find it. Nope. Jim McElwain was also the, the court the quarterbacks coach in 2011. <laughs> I thought he might've been O line. And then in 2009, uh, their coaching staff, Jim McElwain quarterback. So literally Alabama's won like 97 national titles in the last 10 years. 
Uh, I know it makes no sense. Every single one, their offensive um, coordinator was their quarterback's coach. Right. So, again, that doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. It just means it, if you find the right guy, it can work that way. Right? You just got to make sure you have to find the right guy. No doubt about it. And it was yeah. Brandon that was wrapping gifts, by the way. Right. I and and Searcher Green says you can be a good OC and not be a good quarterback. So I, I thought we made that pretty clear. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, we just pointed to Clemson as not having an OC that was a quarterback's coach. Right. I mean, it's again, there's not a right or wrong way to do it. Right. I mean, I don't it, it's like it's like being in the box versus being on the field. It's, right. it's just there's no right or wrong answer to right. it. It's just what works the best for you and the communication and making and the, sure you're hiring a guy that's good at doing that. Right. Exactly. Joe Brady was not the quarterback's coach at LSU in 2009. He wasn't. He was Did the he pass game position? coordinator. He was a, yeah, he was he's a, pass, a, he was a receivers okay. coach. Receiver. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. He he was not he was not the quarterback's coach on that football team. So again, we're not saying there's only one way to do it. If if you want to have a conversation about whether or not Tommy Reese is good enough to do that, okay, we can have that conversation. I, I think he can. I think Searcher doesn't. And that, those people, and that's fair because again, the results speak for themselves and they sure. have not produced great quarterbacks. And that's right. a fair conversation. It's just what I'm saying is you don't ha- there's not a wrong or right way in theory to do it. If you have the right coach, you can get it done. I personally hate having an offensive line coach as my offensive coordinator. I don't like it. There have been times that it's worked, though. Sure. Right? So that's where I'm coming from. Again, we're not saying that this is – they're doing it the right way at Notre Dame. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're doing it the way I like it. Right. But that doesn't mean it's the right. only way to do it. And right. there's evidence that it works the way both I like ways. it. There's In evidence it works yeah. the other way. Sure. It's just, but in each instance, you had the right people in place. That's, that's my thing. Yep. And, you know, like Clemson, I don't think Tony Elliott's a great offensive coordinator by himself. I don't think Jeff Scott's a great offensive mind by himself. Neither of them had a ton of success since they split up, right? Well, that's kind of funny because I don't like co-coordinators. Matter of fact, I hate co-coordinators, especially on offense. Right. I think it's terrible. But you know what? Clemson won two national titles doing that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So if you find the right people and they work well together and, and you have a good staff around them, it can work. You just yeah. got to make sure you got the right people. And that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I think, Vince, that's going to wrap it up. If you want to, we, we like had it. so many great questions today. Yeah. This uh, is kind of like a semi mailbag, yeah. but not really. Yeah. yeah. But we had some points but of emphasis great. here. Octavia, real quick, where are the tailgates at specifically when you have them? I'd like to meet you guys. It changes week to week because Notre Dame doesn't have like assigned parking. Right, uh, they kind of have where you go, so we'll you always <laughs> we'll always uh, we'll always put things out about where we are at the time. So w- w- when we get to that point in time, we'll uh, we'll we'll get it. I'm Absolutely. sorry, this is they're talking about great Christmas movies. So Omar, <laughs> uh, Sid Irish says Sid Irish is my favorite Christmas film. Omar said mm. Die Hard is the best Christmas film, and then uh, Sid Irish comes down here with this. Hans Gruber is greater than Nick Saban. That's <laughs> that's rough. Great. That's Dude is great. a straight terrorist. <laughs> and you still take him over Tyler Buckner. I mean, over uh, over Nick Saban. Oh. Sorry. That's that's uh, that's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, yes. And then a- Alan did say something. He says, my thing is you have an OC and Tyler Buckner as a run pass QB. Tyler being only pass QB. I don't think that really matters. It's it's still Just the same. Because that's principle. what you did doesn't mean you can't. Well, coach but even if other they things right. But even if they even if they they, I don't know if that's what he's saying as much as. It's just about being able to teach the entire package to your quarterback, and I think the OC is the best. You know, is going to have to do all that, and he's going to teach that to everybody, and he teaches it to the quarterback. I think whether you're a run pass guy or you know Tommy being a pass only, you know, being only a pass. You, oh, he is saying that. I read that. I thought he said Tyler. So I think you were correct. That that doesn't really matter. Yeah. It, it, what he was, it's just about what you can teach and what you know. Right. I, I don't exactly. I don't think Lou Holtz was a triple option quarterback. Right? <laughs> I think he was a DB, wasn't he? Yeah. No, I'm not saying that to be, be flipping. No, no, I'm just I know. saying I like just got this vision of of Lou Holtz being a triple option quarterback. That's yeah. all it was in my head. So, I just got it visually. <laughs> yeah, I just again, Sorry. it's find the right guy. But you know, look, I I coached receivers. I played one season of receiver in my life. I was a freshman in high college. Right. I coached an all American running back. I played zero snaps of running back in my life. Right. Right. You know the game. You know how to teach exactly. it. Exactly. You get your I, players. I've coached to play offensive the best line before. Yeah. 
I was five eight, one hundred and sixty five pounds in high school. Yeah. So like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you, just, you yeah, you couldn't have got away with that where I played high school football. But that's the nice thing about playing in uh, good old <laughs> Northern Indiana. That's what I'm saying. I was never an offensive lineman. I was, yeah. I was. Now I played wide receiver in a triple option offense. So you could have called me an offensive lineman, but you know, yeah, yeah it's just an extension of. But, yep. And then you know. tomorrow during our uh, mailbag, we we sh- we're gonna we may have to try to have a debate about whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Before we leave here, Vince. Die Hard a Christmas movie, yes or no? And your I future employment at Irish Breakdown depends. I don't on fall the on either side. It doesn't matter to me. I watch it. That's when the I wrong answer. It. That's Sorry. just as bad as having the wrong answer. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Yeah, so I mean, yes, I just, it, that's when Christmas it gets watched. Movie. So that's fine. That's fine. Yes. I, the whole I just, thing was built around Christmas. There, there are certain people that are just like so for or so against, and it's just like whatever, man. I'm just gonna watch it and enjoy it. Yeah. Like, that's well, how you know I what? Am. Sometimes, Vince, it's it's right to. Are it's we, right to, I mean, to come down and have a no, we now the, like the only a negative is Christmas movie the only thing. negative is it wasn't released at Christmas. That's the only the, the only drawback. Uh, okay. See, there you go. But it's a Christmas movie, it's built around Christmas. So we're gonna go with Christmas movie. Fair enough. I'm, I'm yep. good with that. That's where we're gonna go. So I'm, great I'm show today, everybody. You have yeah. some great questions, great comments. Michael S, thank you for, for bringing the tough questions and and um and uh, being willing to take a point of view that wasn't necessarily that was exactly. not something that a lot of people we wouldn't take. That. So I love it. Absolutely. This is not a place where if you don't think here, he stands the best hire ever. Go find another place. No, this is not at all. Let's talk football. And I thought, Michael, you did a great job of making your point of what you believe and then hearing what we had to say. That's yeah. what I love about this channel, man. It makes yep. it a great channel. So and Brandon's got the big, biggest question of the day. Will there be a mailbag on Christmas Eve? Yes. yes is the answer we yep. will definitely have one tomorrow uh at the moment we're planning for one o'clock uh unless something changes and i saw some people talking about how they were at costco this morning grape road and all that that's why we added it two o'clock because i was in the ridiculously long line at costco and the grape road area with all of my chillins uh shopping for my wife so it was a long involved process so we moved it's to his two. fault we went to two o'clock. It's my fault it is all my fault uh, but we got all of our shopping done, so I'm happy about we'll it. We'll be at one tomorrow. One tomorrow. That's correct. Yep. Yes. Looking forward to it. Yep. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Check out Irish Breakdown message board. Sign up because all this Harry He Stand stuff that everyone's talking about today, you'd have known this days and a couple weeks ago if you were part of the message board at Irish Breakdown. Uh, plus, a lot of great conversation, a lot of great talk, a lot of great discussion. It's where we can always continue the conversations as we move forward. And of course, check out irishbreakdown.com. Give yes. us a five star review. Give us a like. Hit the hit the notification bell. Hit the subscription button if you haven't already done so. We are getting close to eight thousand subscribers. We're not that far away. We've grown so much. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, and most importantly, come back tomorrow, one o'clock, for our Irish Breakdown mailbag. For Vince, I'm Brian. Have a great day. Merry Christmas from your Irish Breakdown family.